Good morning, afternoon, and evening, depending on where you are in the world. I'm Tanya Winders, the president and CEO of Allergy and Asthma Network, and the current president of the Global Allergy and Airways Patient Platform. And it's my pleasure to welcome you to the Global Food Allergy Summit 2022. Today could not have happened without the organization and the support of so many individuals. So I want to kick off just by saying a huge thank you to the Allergy and Asthma Network staff, the uh, GAP, Global Allergy and Airways Patient Platform staff and member organizations, as well as the Global Food Therapy uh, leadership and, and Dr. Jones and Dr. Shaw, who you'll meet in just a few moments. And without their efforts really of coming together over two years ago to talk about the need for a Global Food Allergy Summit, we wouldn't be gathered in this room here today and across the globe. Um, it's pretty impressive that we actually across the globe are a community of over 800 strong that have uh, gathered to get today and registered for the Global Food Allergy Summit. And, and this is an opportunity for us to really take a step back and to think about how the space of food allergy in our food allergy community has evolved from essentially a black and white avoidance or be exposed uh, to your food allergen and the risk of that to now really living in full color with so many different diagnostic options, prevention options, treatment options. And so throughout our two days together, we're going to have that opportunity to really continue to evolve and, and understand that full color food allergy um, perspective that we will uh, again highlight over this time together. Um, certainly, again, it is so important that all of you have chosen to be here. Um, but why is it important that you've chosen to be here? I think it really uh, is best thought about in terms of some of the, the numbers and statistics. And we know that these aren't just numbers or st statistics, they are actually individuals' lives. And so in the next three minutes, even in the time that I've been speaking, one person in the US has gone to the ER due to anaphylaxis. Over the course of the four hours today, four hours tomorrow, that will equate to actually thousands ending up in the emergency room due to a life-threatening food allergic reaction. And so sometimes we get numb to this because we're the community, we live it, we breathe it, it's our work every day. But for those that are actually walking that journey, that are finding themselves in the midst of that emergency situation, it's frightening, right? And yet we are hopeful that today will not be fear-based. We are hopeful that over the next two days of hearing from the experts, of really understanding our hearts and passion around food allergy, that you hear a message of hope. You hear a message of empowerment. Because once someone is educated and informed, then they truly can be empowered to live with food allergies rather than to be in fear of their food allergies. So that's why it's so important that each of us is here today and tomorrow to come together. And again, it could not be without the partnership of Global Food Therapy, Allergy and Asthma Network, and the Global Allergy and Airways Patient Platform. It also could not be without the support of our sponsors. And we are so incredibly grateful to Amune, DBV Technologies, Genentech, and Novartis for their support of this two-day event and allowing us all the opportunity to come together. You know, when I step back and, and think about the fact that in my 20 years of this journey of food allergy, the prevalence continues to grow. Um, the knowledge continues to grow. The science continues to evolve. And yet so many people are still living in that sort of 2000 paradigm or 2010 paradigm of food allergy. And so again, throughout the Global Food Allergy Summit, I think you'll hear fresh perspectives that come absolutely from 2022. We're going to talk about awareness. We're going to talk about preparedness. We're going to talk about the psychosocial aspects of living with food allergy and some of those real world concerns that families like yours and like mine experience every day. But we're also going to be intentional about making sure that we have hope throughout the time together. So 
again, who has come together today to um, moderate and to help lead the effort of the Global Food Allergy Summit today and tomorrow. Um, I could not do this without Dr. Doug Jones and Dr. Atul Shaw, who, as I said, you know, a couple of years ago, we got on the phone, we had this conversation, we shared our hearts and passion for this community and for bringing an event together that would offer hope, that would offer insight and, and be innovative in its approach. And so I wanna take just a moment to recognize Dr. Jones and Dr. Shaw and introduce them to you as well. Um, Dr. Doug Jones is an American board certified allergist and and he's treated thousands of food allergy patients from all over the world for close to a decade. He's passionate about furthering education and science to help food allergic families, and he has co-founded two entities, Global Food Therapy and a nonprofit organization, Food Allergy Support Team. Both are dedicated to supporting patients and doctors to alleviate the burden of food allergy. So welcome, Dr. Jones, and thank you for co-hosting with me today. Uh, next is Dr. Atul Shaw, and Dr. Shaw is a board-certified food allergy specialist and founder of New York Food Allergy and Wellness, the first food OIT center in New York. He is also an author of Amazing Allergist Awesome Book Series for Children and Food Allergy My Journey OIT Journal. All of these are available on Amazon, and he really has the passion as a student for life and measures his success by the lasting impact and legacy that he will leave behind. Dr. Shaw and Dr. Jones have co-founded Global Food Therapy to educate physicians, the OIT Connect online platform for OIT practices, and OIT patient app for families to simplify the oral immunotherapy OIT process using cutting edge science and cloud-based technology. And so again, thank you, Dr. Shaw, for coming alongside and, and partnering with us in the next two days in, in moderating as well. So when we look at our time together um, over the course of today, I wanted to provide you with an overview. Um, I'm gonna be your kickoff speaker with a topic around knowing your why and what brings us all together today. And we're also gonna hear a very powerful patient testimony in that first session. And that's gonna be important throughout our entire time together. We wanna to keep the patient voice front and center throughout the entire um, online program and, and, and live program over the next two days. Our second session will be Dr. Doug Jones talking on food allergy, the real pandemic, and helping us to put this in perspective again in 2022, where does food allergy stand in, in global public health? And then we'll hear from Dr. Shaw, who will uh, talk about proper testing and diagnosing. We know that it all begins with getting that appropriate diagnosis and that so many patients and families, unfortunately, don't get that accurate diagnosis. And so we're going to have that conversation around proper diagnosis and testing. Uh, then we'll turn to food allergy medical management and strategies. And we'll hear from Dr. Priya Bonsal on the food allergy guidelines and research. And Dr. Bonsal will, will help us to understand what is the latest expert opinion and thought around food allergy guidelines. Then we'll hear from Dr. Siegel on the severity of reaction. Um, we know that this can be quite challenging at times and, and sometimes subjective, right? Or and really trying to determine what is a severe reaction versus a mild reaction. And so having that expert opinion about this topic is gonna to be really important. And I'm looking forward to that uh, for my own knowledge. And then session five, I'm sorry, session six will be from uh, Dr. Nicholas Papadopoulos, who will talk about maternal diet impact. You know, there's a lot of conversation around what happens in those uh, formative months of a maternal diet, also while breastfeeding. And, and so those formative months of a child's life, what is the difference and what difference can that make? And so again, I think that we'll hear from Dr. Papadopoulos about that maternal diet impact. And then as we round out our day, we'll hear from Dr. Douglas Mack on early introduction of foods and LEAP. And again, a topic that has gained so much attention over the last few years and uh, how we approach early introduction of foods for high-risk children. 
And so we're excited to hear from Dr. Mack on that topic. Then we're going to have a little bit of, I guess, a pro-con debate or discussion from Dr. Richard Wasserman and Dr. Warner Carr on OIT goals and risk. And again, this will be an opportunity to kind of look at different uh, FDA approved and non approved solutions when it comes to oral immunotherapy and think through what are the pros and cons of each. And then finally, we'll wrap up with this comp topic around um, what is your brand of genes in our afternoon session by Dr. Sindler. And again, this is where uh, environment and genetics actually come together. And we talk about what is that impact on food allergy of epigenetics, environment and genetics. And so again, really excited to hear from Dr. Sindler on that topic. So we'll wrap up our afternoon here by 2 p.m. Eastern um, in the US. And for those of you, again, who are watching globally, thank you for making time in your weekend, whether that be early morning, late evening, you know, we know that people are joining from all over the world and giving up your free time to be a part of the Global Food Allergy Summit. So thank you again for being here. All right, so as we get started and think about this first topic of knowing your why, um, I always love the book uh, by Simon Sinek. I'm not sure if, you, any, if anyone knows who Simon Sinek is, but he's an author that talks about start with why. And in this book that he wrote about starting with your why has really been very formative for me because so many times we get caught up in what we're doing and the way we're doing it, the, the you know, what and the how, that we forget really why we started doing what we chose to do. And so I want you all, whether you're online or here in the room, to take a step back to that point in time, that decision that you made, number one, in coming and being a part of the Global Food Allergy Summit, as to why you chose to tune in. Um, but number two, why you maybe chose the path that you chose if you are a practicing provider in this space um, or if you are a patient advocate in this space. Um, you know, for me, my why actually starts um, a, about 15 years ago where I was sitting at Thanksgiving dinner with my family in rural Mississippi. I was a young mother of five children under the age of seven. So I had a seven-year-old, a six-year-old, a four-year-old, a three-year-old, and a one and one plus at that time. And we're sitting at Thanksgiving dinner, and my one plus, we gave her a bite of a jello salad at Thanksgiving dinner. And within just a few moments, she began to break out in hives around her mouth. And I asked my mother-in-law, as respectfully as I could, <laughs> what was in the salad, uh, what was in the jello? And she said, oh, um, it, well, it's, it's um, jello and Cool Whip. Oh, and, and there were a few pecans sprinkled on top. And by this time, Carson, her Face is turning really red. She's got hives all over. She, her, she, obviously, she was, you know, in discomfort. And I'm like, I think she's having an allergic reaction. Now, I had been in this field at that time for several years. Um, I knew the signs of an allergic reaction <laughs> to food. I actually helped educate primary care physicians on allergy and food allergy um, in my pharmaceutical role, diagnostic role. And yet I sat there in that moment, second guessing, is this an allergic reaction? Should I do something? And what should I do? And in that moment, I was not the president of Allergy and Asthma Network. I was not the expert uh, in the, the field that I had been trained. I was a mom in a crisis moment of my baby is there's something wrong. So within a few moments, Carson began, um, her throat began, her tongue began swelling, her throat began swelling. She started going <coughs> <coughs> and I knew then that she was having anaphylaxis for sure and that um, we had to get her to an emergency facility. The problem was we were 20 minutes from the nearest ER. Uh, we were in rural Mississippi. So um, I had been a drill 
now knowing that that was not the thing to do, but it, it was what I, I didn't have epinephrine, so it was the thing to do. I grabbed Benadryl, gave her Benadryl, we put her in the car and rushed her to the ER because we didn't want to wait on an ambulance to get out there. And the entire, what was supposed to be a 20 minute drive ended up being about a 15 minute drive at a very high rate of speed. Um, I was praying that we would get there in time and that she would live. And I had that moment. And even now, 15 years later, I can go right back to that moment. And although Carson doesn't remember it, I do as a mom. And it helped to fuel my decision 10 years ago to come to work at Allergy and Asthma Network, to lead Allergy and Asthma Network as CEO, and then ultimately to lead Global Allergy and Airways Patient Platform CAP. Because I knew that if I, with the knowledge, with the information, with the preparation that I had, even in that moment, had that fear, had that anxiety, um, and, and had to then navigate the system to get an appropriate diagnosis and appropriate treatment and, and not, and be empowered, to be educated and empowered, that there were millions others, that millions of others like me out there. And so my why is, is definitely that two-year-old, uh, less than two-year-old sitting at Thanksgiving dinner, who now is 17 and in her senior year and ready to choose her college and, and move off into the real world. Um, but over that time of the last 15 years since that first initial diagnosis and incident, it has been a difficult journey to navigate. We've had challenges along the way. We've had two steps forward, three steps back, thinking we, you know, we're doing all the right things and had all the right preparedness and awareness and, you know, double epinephrine auto injectors and all that good stuff. And yet we've had accidental exposures. We've had moments of fear. Thankfully, none quite like that moment uh, 15 years ago. But I have to tell you, as I stand on the brink of launching Carson into the world um, and, and being totally independent, living on her own, I'm still a little fearful of that phone call. Um, it still breaks my heart every day that we get those calls at the network from families that didn't know, that weren't prepared, that had to say goodbye to their loved one, to their child. Um, we get those calls every day from individuals who at least two or three times a day as they're eating have that thought in the back of their mind of could this be the time you know could this be that accidental exposure could this be the time that i experience anaphylaxis and don't get to the er on time don't get the care that i need so that's my why it's not only my now 17 year old independent, fierce, ready to go young adult living with food allergy, but it's the millions of those stories that we hear each and every day, uh, both US and abroad. And so as we go throughout our time here over the next couple of days, I would beg you, implore you to remember your why. Remember what brought you to this table, what, what brought you to this place. Um, and, and the, the positives, the lessons learned. I know for us, in so many ways, it has changed um, Carson and her empathy towards others. It has certainly made us much more aware of what we eat, how we eat, how we live our life, the, you know, the just consciousness of health overall and appreciation of that health overall. And it's also made us recognize how blessed and fortunate we are that we have access to quality physicians who have taken the time to hear us, to offer the latest science, to offer the latest in diagnosis and treatment and prevention of food allergy, um, who have listened and, and engaged us in sheer decision making that you're going to hear more about over the course of these two days. And yet, I'm reminded that is not the norm. It's not the global experience. 
and we'll hear from, the, from individuals, we'll hear from patient testimonies and stories of how maybe it didn't happen in that way, or you know, it, it, they still are living with some of those limitations due to that diagnosis of food allergy. So keep that why in the forefront of your mind. Keep that patient voice in the forefront of your mind as we go throughout our time together in the next two days. And I know that my next guest and speaker is gonna help us to do that. It's my pleasure to introduce to you Dr. Renee Matthews. Um, Renee uh, is, is really just such an eloquent speaker about her experience of living with life-threatening food allergies and also with asthma. And it is what I think helped to fuel her decision to become a primary care provider, but also to become a social influencer and to help it throughout her community to spread the awareness and preparedness messages that we'll hear from her today. So Dr. Renee, come and share with us a little bit about your why. Hello, everyone. So yes, I'm Dr. Renee, and I am 46 years old, but I have had food allergies my entire life. I, I tell everyone I was born this way. So I, my, my mother breastfed me because she's an amazing woman, and she learned, you know, that I was her first child. So she said, oh, I'm going to breastfeed. She was off for three months. She breastfed for three months. And at the end of the three months, she went back to work, and she started to feed me food, of course. And oatmeal was the first food, and that was the one that my mother is a respiratory therapist, you should also know. And also, I was born with asthma, and so she, of course, respiratory therapist, she knew that as well. So as soon as I was having this oatmeal, she saw and she knew. She said, she's having an allergic reaction. And immediately, that's what started our journey. And I, am aller I was allergic to a whole lot more then than I am now. And everyone's like, you're allergic to so much, but it was way worse before. So currently, I do not eat citrus fruits, wheat, rye, barley, nuts, chocolate, seafood, and I think that's it. And um, I can't remember sometimes. But um, in seafood, I also, um, I cannot smell cooking. Now I can sit and eat, if someone's eating their seafood, as long as I don't touch their plate, they don't touch mine, I'm fine. But if I walk into a restaurant, a house or whatever, and I smell seafood cooking, I do start wheezing. Um, so like I said, it was far worse before, it is a lot better now. I am so encouraged by all of the amazing things that are happening now because my mom didn't have these options. So how did we navigate the world? We just were careful, um, my mom, I, but I've often asked, how did I know what I was allergic to? Because I was allergic at such a young age. And she said, I would ask, can I eat something? She'd say, you're allergic. And finally, it clicked. I figured it out. I was able to catalog all that information. And I was able to, I, I did a lot of things without my parents. My parents worked full time, so they weren't always with me. Not all of my caregivers could remember all my allergies, but I knew what they were. I also had the blessing of my, my best friend, which was my sister, who is three years younger than me, but my sister was an amazing advocate before we knew what the word advocate was. My sister was my taste tester. She would taste the foods. Even at six, seven years old, she couldn't articulate what it was, but she'd say, Renee, you can't eat this. And nine times out of 10, she was absolutely correct. And she saved my life many a times. So it is so important that your kids know what they're allergic to. And then it's really awesome if they have a sibling or a friend. So it's really good that they tell their friends that they're allergies. Um, I wrote a children's book because I wanted people to understand how I was able to navigate it. But I also want you to understand, you know, your kids, you'd be amazed the information that they can hold and how they can get through life. I've actually lived in, I think, three other countries outside of the US. And obviously, I had to eat while I was there. So, um, and I actually lived on an island for two years, which everyone's like, but you're allergic to seafood. Yes, I lived on an island for two years. I went to restaurants and ate. I never had any problems. You don't smell, cook, smell um, seafood cooking when you go to most restaurants, do you? So I didn't have a problem. And I never had a cross-contamination issue. And I was fine. All of my travels, I usually do not pack my suitcase full of food because... I will figure out something that I can eat when I get there. Um, and then, of course, now we have the blessing of the Internet. So you can check menus prior to going and figure out, oh, OK, this is what they have and figure out what you can eat or 
figure out you can't eat anything there and you need to make a different choice. Um, I am really good about, you know, letting people know that I'm with, that I have food allergies. I also do carry AviQ. And so I have that with me and my friends know, and they're like, where is it? In case they know, so that they, they do have to use it. They can use it. I love that it tells you what to do because in panic situations, not everybody's as calm as I am. So just in case they can take care of me. But I have just really been blessed with a really great community that understands that this is just, this is me. This is the way it's been. This is the way it is going to be. And I, you know, I have the cute stories, of course, you know, my mom probably wasn't so cute at the time, but now it's cute. I was trying to help her because that's what I do. My mother, my sister had just been born. I want to help mommy. And I decided to crack some eggs because I thought I was going to cook with her and I'm allergic to eggs. And I especially cannot touch egg whites. So of course, my mom's like, where is Renee? It's so quiet around here. I was sitting in the corner with these eggs all over me, wheezing. And that's why I was so quiet because of course, now I've had an allergic reaction. Of course, my father was at work and my mother had to put two children in the car and get me to the ER because I'm seriously sick. So, you know, and like I said, it's funny now, wasn't funny then. And then curiosity killed the cat the day that I decided, you know, everyone is sitting there eating nuts and cracking these shells. I thought it was really cute. And so I decided, well, while they're doing that, I'm gonna try it too. And no one was paying attention and I decided to do it. And I also decided to stuff the shell up my nose and my mother, what is going on? Sure enough, she gets me to the ER because of course I'm wheezing at this point. And then when I get there, you know, there's a shell in her nose. <laughs> My mother was so mad, but, um, and I actually remember that. Um, so, you know, I, you know, curiosity did kill the cat on a few things, but for the most part, I am really good about, you know, knowing. And I also will say that in my household, all of my allergens were always around. My family did not stop eating anything because I couldn't eat them. It's just Renee can't eat them. And so my mom would cook seafood. My father's from the island of Antigua. He was not going to give up seafood because he had a child that was allergic. So she cooked the seafood outside in the garage. And so the house didn't smell like it. And I was fine. I've never had a problem when my mom made seafood. So, um, so yeah, my, I think that the way that I grew up really helped me to where I am now because I didn't grow up in a bubble. And so I'm able to explore all sorts of different you know, opportunities and different places and do different things because I know how to handle things and I know what to do, what to say. And so, um, so I really want to encourage parents that it's really going to be okay. It's not the end of the world and your child will have a really wonderful, fulfilling life. I did obviously go off to college and became a doctor and partly, like you said, due to the fact that I was born with asthma and allergies. So thank you so much. Thanks, Renee. Before you go, um, just one quick comment, maybe, because I know you and I have had this conversation yes. about being a person of color yes. and living with food allergies. Oftentimes, maybe there's some cultural differences yes. or things. Maybe speak to that for just okay. a moment. Okay. So um, I will say that it's, you know, their food allergies are common in the Black community, but oftentimes we are not properly diagnosed so we are not we don't know so you don't you know you, you got sick but no one ever went and investigated why you got sick and they just said okay well that person needs to avoid that but they don't really understand why um and so that can be a bit troubling and when you don't have the access to go to an allergist to figure out exactly what's the problem and why did that happen and then also unfortunately you know, we have grandparents and great grandparents that don't quite understand. And so they insist on still cooking, you know, I'm allergic to airborne seafood, you're still cooking seafood and you knew I was on my way over. And um, or I'm staying at your house and I return and I'm like, wait a minute, what's that smell? So, you know, we still have to work really hard to help our you know, especially the elderly generation, because I think they just don't understand they just when they were growing up, it wasn't like that. You just need to be patient and help them understand that this is a serious matter. Um, people can die. And so you need to understand that this is why you have to not cook that, or this is why you cannot feed the child this just because the mom isn't there and you wanna feed it to them. No, she told you not to for a reason. And that's why you cannot feed it to them. So it's really important. And unfortunately, like she said, there are some barriers and 
we don't have the um, access to the information. So I think that if we got access to the information, I know grandma is not trying to kill her grandchild. I know that for a fact, um, as well as aunties and uncles, I know they're not, but they just don't understand. And so if you can make them to understand, you know, I my like I said, my dad is from Antigua and my family and the islands, it just wasn't as popular, you know, or common to have food allergies. But I came along and now they all understand and it's not a big deal, but it's just about communicating and making them understand. And hopefully we can increase health equity, equality, health equality, and we can get access to allergists and immunologists and pulmonologists so that we can have the conversation and people can understand and we can have less children, unfortunately, dying from anaphylaxis. Thank you, Renee. I really appreciate your perspective and your yeah. why. Um, it's been so powerful to work alongside you and looking forward to the next couple of days. Yes, thank you. Thank you. So as we move into our next session, I'm going to invite Dr. Doug Jones to join me here at the podium. He's going to talk about the food allergy uh, pandemic and, and, and really bring that to light. And what I have asked is every speaker to sort of start with their why, why they came to this space, why they're committing to, to the next two days and to this event uh, and, and their commitment to the community. And so we'll start with Dr. Jones. Thank you. Uh, it's great to be with you and uh, welcome everyone from across the world and wherever you're watching. So great to, to be here. My why started shortly after I joined or started my private practice. You know, I'd been just finished my training and I'd been going through and seeing a number of food allergy patients. And there was one family in particular where I had already seen the son who was allergic to peanuts and tree nuts. And the, the family brought in their 11 month old daughter who had had some, a small exposure to milk and she had some drip on her and she broke out in hives and the mom was devastated. And it was right before her first birthday. And she said, you know, I'm, I don't even know if we can do birthday cake, right? And so she, she brought her in she said, gosh, we're already having to avoid peanuts and tree nuts. We hope it's, it's just milk. And long story short, as we tested this patient, it turns out the 11 month old was milk, eggs, wheat, peanuts, and tree nuts. And the mom was absolutely devastated. And I remember discussing this with her in our clinic. And with tears in her eyes, she said, what do I feed my child? And at that stage, I was sick to my stomach and I, I, I looked back and I said, I have no idea. I don't know. And I was as devastated as her. And, and as she left, I walked back in my office and I sat there and I thought, I did no service to, to them today. I gave them no hope. They deserve better. There has to be better. There has to be another way. I can't continue in my role to give this kind of information to somebody that, you know, they just deserve hope at least that. And so I, at that point, dedicated myself to trying to be better and be more skilled in, in food allergy in particular, so that I could at least offer patients hope. And so learned, you know, quite a bit about treatment, about options, oral immunotherapy in particular, which we'll hear about uh, over the next couple of days. And as Tanya said at the beginning, we don't want this to be a fear-based conference. We want this, or summit, we want this to be one of hope because there are choices, there are options. This is 2022 and uh, things are moving rapidly and moving forward and the science is evolving and it's amazing. And I'm just really uh, passionate about this because through the years, my why is I've wanted to make a better impact, a more significant impact for perhaps those who haven't had a voice, for those who have felt unheard, for those who have been dismissed and not given hope. And my why is to try and give those patients some hope. So let's move into the, the next phase here. As we have gone through the last few years, the world has been consumed by something that's microscopic, potentially life-threatening, unpredictable, 
And what has happened? You know, in, in certain patients or populations are at more risk than others. There's been misinformation, information, division, all kinds of, of you know, rhetoric going on. And as such, because of the unpredictable nature, because of the, the potentially life-threatening situation, what did we do? Isolation, uh, distancing, mandates, all kinds of, uh, you know, things imposed upon us to try and keep us safe. And it's had a social, mental, emotional, physical, and financial burden on everyone. Does that sound familiar to anyone with food allergy? Does that situation sound any what remote familiar to somebody? Yes, that is the life that somebody with food allergy lives every single day. Dr. Renee, is that, that's the life you've lived, correct? Yes. It's very similar of, of that situation. So I think the world has got a small glimpse into you know, the food what a food allergy patient lives. And so that really is kind of that pandemic. But in terms of um, also, as we've gone through the pandemic and we've had all of this, what have people searched for? Normalcy. They've, they've wanted a hope for getting back to normalcy. And as I talk to my food allergic patients, that's really what all they want. They want kind of that sense of normalcy. And it, with food allergy, uh, Dr. Renee also mentioned, you know, with her grandparents, for instance, they don't quite understand because their generation was different than our generation. And the, one of the questions I get is, is it truly different? Uh, is there truly a rise or pandemic or epidemic proportion of food allergy? Because as you look at, you know, certain things with food allergy, there, there's, is it overdiagnosed or is it a real true increase? So studies are done, for instance, when you think about food allergy with questionnaires that may be subject to bias, some may mistake true allergy for just other symptoms with food. You know, anyone that comes into my clinic so often, if they have any symptom with food, any symptom at all, um, they think it's food allergy, but that's not necessarily the case. And so are other things just, you know, being mistaken for that? There's high false positives with traditional allergy tests. There's also non-validated, widespread use of non-validated tests that give even more false positives and confusion. And about twice as many people think they have food allergy that actually does. So this, despite all of this, despite these variables, we do know that allergy is increasing in epidemic proportions. And what is happening today is not the same as those that come before us. The, sta the statistics are staggering. And I, and I loved how Tanya put it, where, you know, in just a few minutes that are talking, you know, people have already gone to the emergency room, room with anaphylaxis. The prevalence has increased over 50%. And every three minutes, someone is having a food allergic reaction. More than 40% of children uh, with food allergy have experienced a serious anaphylaxis. Medical procedures to treat anaphylaxis anaphylaxis have increased 377% between 2007 and 2016. So uh, the statistics are real. This is growing in epi epi um, epidemic proportions. But one thing, just like the pandemic with, with the coronavirus, as we focus so much on positive tests, hospitalizations, deaths, you know, sometimes with food allergy, especially in the medical literature, we often focus on how much time, you know, epi is used, um, how many ER visits and or even deaths, which are important statistics. But one thing that is often forgotten is I think we need to also look beyond the headline. There is also collateral damage, much like the much like, you know, the pandemic where we so much of the media is focused on certain statistics but so many times the collateral damage is forgotten. It's very similar with food allergy. What about the impact of psychological stress, mental, emotional, social, physical, and financial burden? You know, it's hard to kind of sense the true burden uh, that someone is carrying until that's lifted. And that was probably one of the more 
gratifying things that I've found in treating food allergy is seeing that burden lifted uh, from patients. So with this change, is it by chance or has it been true change? So there's a number of reasons that, that we talk about in terms of why have we had this epidemic rise in food allergy. This is not an all-inclusive list, but I wanna just focus really briefly in the time that we have and just hit the highlights of, I think, some of the more important ones. There's something called the hygiene hypothesis. You're gonna hear a lot about something called the microbiome, vitamin D, and also our genetics. So just to briefly introduce this, what is the hygiene hypothesis? That is kind of a hypothesis that allergists have debated for years of, are we too clean? Meaning uh, people, as you look at the, the scale of non-allergic versus allergic, those people that live in more of a rural uh, community, developing countries, large family size, uh, low antibiotic use, uh, poor sanitation, they actually have lower incidence of food allergy or allergy in general compared to those who um, are living in uh, a more westernized country. They have fall, smaller family size, uh, higher use of antibiotics. They have a higher incidence of food allergy. So there's kind of this, this concept of, are we too clean? Growing up, there was a quote that uh, was often said to me where, they, where my parents said, the idle person the devil will surely put to work. And, and I often think in, in our immune system, if we're too clean and it's kind of idle, the devil's putting us to work in an allergy sense. Uh, you know, it, our, our immune system's starting to get in trouble there. So part of with this hygiene hypothesis that goes along with this leads into the next thing of the microbiome. And it kind of starts from the mouth and goes all the way down through the gut. Um, promoting bacteria. So as we talk about being too clean, that microbiome that's in our mouth all the way through our gut and actually on our skin as well, uh, we get less diverse. And we can start with mouthwashes, other things that can affect the microbiome, stress, antibiotic use, antacids, uh, food, what's in our diet, uh, anti-inflammatory, C-sections, those types of things may affect the health of our gut, which then may affect, you know, how our body is seeing and interacting with food. We're going to, I think we're going to have some more talks more in depth on this. I'm just trying to int introduce some of these concepts. Um, vitamin D, is this the real deal? You know, about 15 years ago, I was just getting introduced to some of the vitamin D literature. And a patient actually challenged me. She said, why don't you look into how vitamin D affects the immune system? And I, I loved it. Uh, she had been doing some reading. She had been doing her research, right? And so this patient told me, she said, look into this. And so I've tracked this for the last 15 years. Vitamin D, which is probably poorly named, it's more of a, a hormone that's in the steroid family in our body, is a natural anti-inflammatory and immune modulator. And deficiency can lead to an increased risk of food allergy, worsening inflammation. And data, uh, odds of food allergy is 55% lower for those born in the summer versus those born in the winter. And peanut allergy in particular is 2.4 times more likely in children with low vitamin D. So this is something to kind of pay attention to. When we move into one of those next categories, what's in our genetics, for instance. We can just look at eczema and a gene called filaggrin. Filaggrin is, is critical in uh, kind of the integrity and barrier of our skin. And when we have a mutation in that particular gene, for instance, we're more likely to have eczema and food allergy. And they kind of go hand in hand. And there, there was actually just a, a, a recent article published just this last month, actually, in one of our major journals that showed that, that corresponded with eczema and the skin barrier and actually how that may impact because peanut is actually found in dust in all homes and schools. And that doesn't matter if you avoid it in your home or not. Um, so we often think about, you know, those genetics and 
what may be playing a role with us. So just in summary, and I apologize for going through some of those topics quickly, but again, it was more of just an introduction because we have a lot more coming. But just in, in summary, food allergy has grown in epidemic proportions. There are significant risks, but as we move forward, the science is fantastic uh, in the year 2022. There's so much hope for patients and there's choice and there's options that, that's absolutely available. And there, there is need for more support, more resources and more accurate information and education, which is the crux of this summit is delivering better education information and also delivering hope for those, for those suffering with food allergy. So thank you. Thank you, Dr. Jones. Actually, we've got a couple of questions if you want to stay for just a moment. Um, so a couple of questions from our online community that I think are, are very appropriate for the summary that you know, you've set out. So you talked about the emotional, physical, all of those things. This first question is, is more about sexual health. And it says, do romantic partners have to avoid the food that their partner is allergic to? This is really never talked about. Yeah, it's a great question. Um, you know, and typically they would because um, you can, you know, if somebody's consumed peanut, that can get in the saliva. And as you know, you're kissing, you can absolutely trans, uh, you know, get that exposure. So yes. Yeah. And then another question that's related to the hygiene hypothesis. Uh, so have we seen any data about a correlation between the increase in hand sanitizer use and the increase in allergy or food allergy specifically? Um, I'm not sure with hand sanitizer in particular, but one, there was a study that is really interesting about dishwashers. So in, in they did one study, I think it was in Europe, where homes that, that use dishwashers uh, had a higher incidence of allergy than those that hand wash the dishes. Because when you hand wash the dishes, you actually don't get them as clean. But when you use a dishwasher, hot, you know, the water's hotter and it sanitizes it more. And so those homes actually had a higher incidence. So I'm aware of that study. So in all my efforts to keep a clean house, maybe I'm actually making my children more allergic in some ways, right? A yeah. good excuse for not having a clean, crystal clean house. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Dr. Jones. All right, uh, one final question, just in relation to the, the sort of overdiagnosis and, and the sensitivity of the test that came from our audience that says, um, what can I do if my family members avoid certain foods even without an official diagnosis? Now, I know we're going to talk about diagnosis a little more, yeah. and, and Dr. Shaw will probably address this, but why don't you go ahead and address so, that question? What's the... So what should I maybe tell my family members who are avoiding foods even without oh, a diagnosis? Without the, okay. So yeah, so for those that are avoiding certain foods without the official diagnosis, if there's not that history, you can actually maybe put yourself at more risk of developing the allergy by unnecessarily, unnecessarily avoiding it. So I would really encourage them, get a great diagnosis, get an accurate diagnosis, so you know exactly what you do need to avoid and not unnecessarily avoid. And it's not only a higher risk of developing the allergy by unnecessary avoidance, we also can run the risk, depending on the age or how much is avoiding of, you know, are you going to get nutritional deficiencies or uh, vitamin deficiencies? Cal what's your calorie intake? So th those are some other risk factors that we have to keep in mind. All right. Thank you, Dr. Jones. Yeah. And for those uh, abroad, keep the keep those questions coming. That's fantastic. Yeah, so to our online audience, please do put your questions in the Q&A box. We're going to get to as many of those as possible during our time together. Um, we will have time for questions at the end of each session. And then also we'll have some uh, formal Q&A periods as well throughout the summit. But please, we'll get to as many of them as possible. And we're also going to do an FAQ document afterward that summarizes a lot of the themes of those different questions. So now... It is my pleasure to turn the microphone and the podium over to Dr. Atul Shah. I gave his introduction before, but, oops, sorry, wrong way. There we go. 
So as I said, Dr. Shaw is going to bring us the topic of proper diagnosis and testing. And so very important in a food allergic patient's journey is starting out with that appropriate diagnosis and the evolution of testing that has come throughout the last couple of decades and what is on the horizon. So excited to hear from you, Dr. Shaw. Thank you so much, Tanya. And uh, again, it's wonderful that uh, Tanya, Dr. Renee, and Dr. Jones started us with hope, and that would be my theme as well. So all of uh, all of you who are out there attending today, I want you to at least ask one question. It's what's your why for being on this uh, summit live today? Uh, also ask, uh, are you living in fear or are you living with hope? Uh, our intention is to bring that hope that uh, in 2022 and going into 23, we do not have to live the life we're living with fear of food allergy. Uh, uh, you know, to answer my why, my why, like Dr. Jones, are my patients. I got started in this field because of similar story where unexpected reactions from the family where father is a surgeon, mother is an uh, ophthalmologist. They were in Colorado. They were in a hotel. They asked somebody to get peanut-free pasta because their son has peanut allergy and he needed Appy. Not only that, because of asthma, he ended up in ICU. They came back, asked the chef, we asked for peanut-free pasta, what happened? And chef actually showed the written instruction the waitress gave the order for gluten-free pasta. So the person who made an error led to pasta that was made out of peanut flour and uh, chickpea flour. Now this family is doing everything right. They have the proper diagnosis. They have the auto injectors. They're telling everybody that I need to avoid the food. Someone makes a mistake and they end up in ICU and they almost lost their son. So they came to me for second, third, fourth opinion. This is 2012. And like Dr. Jones, telling them avoidance and having auto injector is the only option you have made me feel inadequate. So I said, give me six months time. I'm gonna do some homework. Uh, looked at some literature at that time, reached out to some of the physicians who were pioneer in the field doing the oral immunotherapy and really made a decision to do something. And that also came around that time I had visited Calcutta, India and there is a quote from Mother Teresa said, if you want the world to be clean, start it in your own backyard. And the day will come where if everybody cleans their backyard, the world will be clean. So it was my desire to do something in my backyard and that's what led to. Now I'm grateful to uh, Tanya and AN leadership that they also gave us platform that now we are no longer in our backyard. We are bringing it to all of you uh, with the hope that you can find your resources where you can also have a new diagnosis, proper diagnosis, and also some treatment options. So the question that came online was very pertinent that if you're avoiding food, which you are not allergic, then what happens? So this is where the burden comes in. It's not only a financial burden. We know that one child with peanut allergy, the average annual cost is around $4,000 plus per year. Uh, but if you avoid multiple food and also you avoid the food unnecessarily, you can have nutritional deficiency. Uh, it's effect on the siblings as well, because the food one child is avoiding, the whole family ends up avoiding unnecessarily. And obviously there's anxiety and anxiety builds on with time. The foods that you avoid one time, it's necessary. And you start avoiding other foods, then you're very, very limited with your choice. So the conversation here would be, what is proper diagnosis? So we as allergists, when we go through a patient's proper diagnosis, why is it essential? Because if you do not have proper diagnosis, you cannot have proper plan, you cannot have proper treatments. It's absolutely necessary to have proper diagnosis. Dr. Jones mentioned that every patient coming with any symptom with food allergy, food does not mean they have food allergy. It could be food intolerance, it could be food sensitivity, Definitely we need to look at food allergy, but why is it essential? So we go through four steps. First is history. Second would be skin test. Third would be labs. And if necessary, oral food challenges. 
So I'm going to briefly go over all of that. So in history, uh, very, very essential is to know what happens with food. So what food, what symptoms, how soon it happened, uh, what were the prior reactions, whether you have had prior ingestion or not. Uh, so complete clinical history is absolutely essential for proper food allergy diagnosis. Uh, prior reactions, food exposure, symptoms, also when was the last reactions, if they have had any prior testing done, if they have had any prior oral challenges done, all that can help uh, narrow down proper diagnosis. One message I want to convey here is sensitization versus clinical allergy. So patients who have had blood tests for uh, allergy or skin tests for allergy have been labeled as food allergic, but many of them have what we call sensitization, meaning their immune system has developed a protein called IgE against some of those foods, not necessarily they're clinically allergic, meaning if they eat the food, they may not have the reaction. So it's very, very essential for treating physicians to differentiate sensitization from true allergy. Uh, and, and that would be part of the diagnostic process. So one of them is skin tests. This is very common. Almost all allergies do the skin test in the office. So the principle of the skin test is you take the food that you want to taste for in an extract form, preferably they're standardized extracts, and you put a tiny amount of that extract under the first layer of the skin, and you allow skin to react if someone has sensitization or allergy, at that part, it will look like a tiny mosquito bite. We call that the wheel or flare. This is one of the system of testing where you have the tray with the wells. In the wells, there are tiny different liquids and the plastic device uh, in the right uh, slide is what punctures the skin to take the tiny liquid under the skin. This is how the reactivity would happen. So someone who does not have allergy, those darts stay as tiny red darts. Those who have true allergy, they will become red, but they also have swelling. So the redness is called flare and the swelling is called will. So the allergist or their team will measure the size of the will and the flare, and that helps us make the diagnosis. Uh, again, with skin prick tests, a couple of points I want to mention is uh, negative skin prick test effectively confirms absence of IgE-mediated allergy. Uh, NPV is a negative predictive value. In layman's term, if your skin test is negative and if test is done properly, you have a 95% chance that you do not have allergy to that food. Positive skin prick test has 50% sensitization and 50% positive predictive value, meaning uh, if you have positive skin tests, you have 50% chance that you're allergic, but you have also 50% chance it might be false positive, meaning you have just sensitization. So positive skin test is not a diagnosis of food allergy, and that's what I want all of you to know. Uh, larger skin prick test size does correlate with likelihood of a reaction. So measuring the size of the redness and the will is very important. And it, is, it has no association with the severity of the reaction. So common question we get is if the skin test bump is bigger, does it mean I'll have anaphylaxis? And it's not true. So second part after skin test is we call lab test. So we do blood test, which is called CBC or complete blood cell count. What we're really looking for is a cell called eosinophils. Uh, IgE, uh, and uh, IgE is the immunoglobulin E. It is one of the protein our immune system makes. So the difference between person who is allergic and person who is not allergic is the allergic individual's immune system has made higher amount of IgE. Uh, you can check that IgE as a total, but you also can check it specific to individual food. Uh, the food component testing is very essential in proper diagnosis. So if someone has allergy to peanut, you can break down peanut protein into different components and you can have Ig against those components checked. And we'll see in the next slide how that helps with the proper diagnosis. Some of the newer tests, one of them is called epitope mapping and the other one is called basophil activation test. So food specific Ig, a couple of points is high total Ig can influence uh, false elevated specific IgE. So many children who have severe eczema, their total Ig is very high. 
and they have Ig for peanut, milk, eggs, nuts, and sometimes get labeled as allergic to all those foods. And at that time, we need to recognize that it is the total Ig that's showing up positive for many foods and not necessarily be allergic to those foods. Uh, second part is level of specific Ig does not predict severity of a reaction. So similar to skin tests, you cannot say that somebody with higher number will have anaphylaxis versus someone with lower number would not have anaphylaxis. And past reaction cannot predict severity of a future reaction. So we'll quickly go over some uh, individual food specific diagnosis. So with peanut allergy, we have history, we'll do skin tests, we'll do the IgE, which is in the scale of 0 0.10 up to 100. Uh, we'll have components. So ERA H2, 6, 1, 3, 8, and 9, these are commercially available. Uh, component number two and six, which are the, in the early part, they are the one considered reactive component or we call high risk component. So somebody with high component two and six is more likely to be allergic to peanut. If someone has component eight alone and not two or uh, six, maybe just the pollen allergic. This is the cross reactive allergy to peanut. Again, if we have total Ig, you can compare that number. Uh, epitope assay is available for peanut commercially uh, and basophil activation. And again, if diagnosis is not clear, you go with oral challenge. Now, these are some of the examples. So the left side is the actual blood test screenshot of a patient. And if you see total peanut number is more than 100, when peanut was broken down, RIH2 is more, more than 100. This patient is likely uh, truly allergic. If there's a clinical history and you have this test, then you know you have the proper diagnosis. Interestingly, the side is the same patient after three months of oral immunotherapy for peanut. This is not a typical number. Most patients take much longer for their Ig to drop, but it was very fascinating for us to see that three months after oral immunotherapy, their peanut Ig went from more than 100 to 38, RIH2 it dropped to 33. Now for milk, similarly, we'll have a history, skin prick test, uh, Ig for milk, milk components are casein, alpha lactalbumin, beta -lac globulin, And sometimes we use that to decide whether you can give somebody baked milk challenge or not, whether someone can tolerate baked milk products or not. So casein is the reactive component, uh, which has a likely association with more severe reactions. Uh, similarly, uh, basophil activation test is available for milk and you can do oral challenge. We do not have epitope assay available for any other food other than the peanut. Uh, similarly, this is an example of someone with milk allergy. IgE for milk is more than 100. When you look at the component, casein is more than 100. Uh, this is for eggs. So you have history, skin prick test, Ig for eggs. These are the egg components, ovomucoid and ovalbumin. Ovomucoid is considered more severe or reactive component. So if there are patients who have ovomucoid low but high ovalbumin. Those patients can benefit uh, by going through baked egg challenge and can tolerate baked egg products. Uh, again, uh, we have basophil activation and oral food challenge that can be done for egg you know. This is an example of someone who had blood test for eggs and peanut. You can see the egg white is more than 100. Ovomucoid is 72. But when you look at their peanut is 2.32 and their era H2 is negative. Those are the patients who will benefit from doing oral challenge for peanut. And you can say that they are not allergic to peanut. Uh, the blood test can show they're allergic to peanut, but through oral challenge, you can confirm that it is not a true allergy. It is a sensitization uh, for peanut. Uh, wheat, again, we have history, we have uh, you know, the one thing with uh, wheat, uh, they have cross reactive with the grass. So those patients do require treatment for grass pollen allergy, uh, and sometimes it's beneficial. Uh, they can have association with other grains. Uh, there's a component of the wheat that is associated with something called wheat dependent exercise induced anaphylaxis. Uh, it is not commercially available as freely, uh, but some labs are doing it. A uh, message I want to convey is gluten sensitivity is different than wheat allergy. Wheat allergy is IgE mediated allergy and it is anaphylactic in nature. 
mutant sensitivity is IgG and it is genetic in nature and it does not trigger anaphylaxis. Uh, and common question we get asked is someone has a celiac disease, can you actually do oral immunotherapy? And the answer is no. Uh, basophil activation helps with IgE mediated wheat allergy and similarly with oral challenge. Uh, this is for soy. Similarly, we have skin prick test cross reactive with legume, peanut, and pollen. That's necessary to know. And the components for soy are four, five, and six, and five is considered more reactive component. Uh, these are components for tree nuts and uh, cashew ANAO3. Uh, Brazil nut, walnut, hazelnut, almond, pistachio, pecan, birch pollen. Uh, with hazelnut, component nine and four are related to true allergy. Component one and eight can be associated with birch pollen. So tree nuts are the fruits of the trees. So those who have tree pollen allergy have possibility of sensitization to tree nuts on the skin test and the blood test. So it's very important that if you have skin test or blood test positive for tree nuts, you need to differentiate is it a true allergy it is, or it is a sensitization. So these are the newer labs. Epitope mapping assay, it's available commercially for peanuts. It's, based, it's a bead-based epitope assay, it's a blood test. And uh, it, it, they claim it to be 93% accurate for peanut diagnosis. Basophil activation test is considered more like a food challenge in the lab where from the blood, the allergy cells called basophils are separated. And those cells are incubated with the food you want to check for. So if it is peanut allergy you want to check for, you have the basophils and the peanut together in the lab. And after some time, you look for activation markers on the basophils. And that helps you with uh, whether they're activated or they're releasing histamine, that's the degranulation part. And now it's available for most common foods. Uh, and whenever there's a question with diagnosis, we do with oral challenge. So it's a gold standard. When in doubt, definitely confirm with food challenge. It must be done in nut supervision. It requires close monitoring, and it can be done for any food, including commercially available food. So with this, I would like to summarize how to get the proper diagnosis. History is absolutely essential. Uh, skin test can add value, but positive skin test does not mean allergy. Uh, labs are different types, and depending on the access you have, your food allergy expert will make the decision of what tests are needed. Not everyone needs all the tests. Uh, and uh, oral challenge should be done when there's any doubt in the diagnosis. Uh, with this, uh, I would like to open up for questions, anything related to um, Great. Thank you so much, Dr. Shaw. We do have a number of questions, so I'm going to hop right to them. The first, um, is there merit to doing IgE milk testing each year to see what the trend in the numbers is? And, and then a follow up to that, what is the point of IgE levels of drawing IgE specific IgE levels if they don't predict severity? So if you'll address both of those. Yep. So, um... To answer the first part, uh, there are foods where child has a natural potential to outgrow. We use the word outgrow, meaning they can be allergic to milk, but over time, the body would not react to milk. So milk, eggs, wheat, and soy fall into that category. They have significant chance if they have uh, those diagnoses early on as an infant. So if you have Ig check for milk, and if you see a trend that numbers are coming down, uh, there's some correlation that those patients are likely to naturally outgrow. But just the Ig for the milk is not sufficient. At that time, if you have component for the milk, including casein, uh, beta like globulin, alpha like albumin, would be very helpful. Uh, to second question, uh, if Ig does not predict the severity of the reaction, why to do it? It's, it's important to have proper diagnosis. So in food allergy up to now, it's all or none. There's no gray area. You have diagnosis of food allergy, you have to avoid. If you do not have food allergy, you don't need to avoid, you need to eat. So IgE is an initial screening test can help that yes, you may have food allergy. But if uh, you have food allergy, it is the exposure of the allergens, the amount of the food, and how your body reacts to that food that time decides the severity of the reaction. So 
if you're able to avoid the food irrespective of the IgE, you're still protected. Irrespective of the IgE, if you're able to eat the food, it is sensitization, it is not an allergy. So at that time, the food allergy or food oral challenge is of very help. So if there's no need to do annual blood test for IgE, if you're already eating that food. So I hope I answered that question. Uh, I always say IgE without symptoms is not allergy, right? That's it, it's sensitization. And so helping people to understand that just because you've got IgE doesn't necessarily equal allergy. Um, another question around patients that have uh, dermatographia urticaria. Uh, do you do skin tests in those individuals or would you just defer to the blood test? So for those who do not know what dermatographia is, dermato is skin, graphia means you can write. So there are patients who have very sensitive skin where if you scratch their screen, skin becomes red and it looks like hives. We call them a linear hives. So the hives will look like uh, lines. So those patients, no matter what kind of skin testing you do, they will have uh, positive tests and they are called false positive. So patients with dermographia, uh, there's no benefit of doing skin testing. And then uh, just a really basic question that we didn't cover at the beginning, but that I think is really important. What's the most common allergen? And then what's some of the more less common allergens that you've treated and seen? So um, the most common allergen diagnosis wise is age dependent, but the uh, nine common allergens in the United States are uh, peanut, milk, eggs, wheat, soy, um, tree nuts, fish, shellfish, and sesame. Sesame has been added now. Uh, the treatment we have done is for almost all foods. Uh, the most common one that requires treatment is usually peanut, and then uh, milk, and then eggs, and then tree nuts. Uh, sesame, definitely, yes. Right. And then one final question and I think we have time for before we move to the next topic, and that is, is an example of sensitization eosinophilic esophagitis reaction, would that be a sensitization or does it really depend on severity? So those who do not know what eosinophilic esophagitis is, it is inflammation of the foot pipe, which is esophagus from the allergy cells called eosinophils. So there are subgroup of children and adults with food allergy who have inflammation of the food pipe. It is not IgE mediated, it is a cell mediated reaction. So many of those patients, when you do skin tests or blood tests or IgE, those tests are negative. So it is clinical history and what triggers their symptom is what helps make the diagnosis of uh, what foods are contributing to EOE. So we cannot rely on skin tests or blood tests for food allergy diagnosis for EOE. But one of those differential diagnoses that, again, only really a board certified allergist is equipped to address. Um, that's correct. Great. Um, I saw one other that's a diagnosis question, so I'm going to uh, trump my last statement. Can certain autoimmune disorders predispose an individual for food allergy or can it manifest a food allergy? So if you look at the definition of autoimmune condition, autoimmune, their immune system has made antibody against certain cells in the body, but it is IgG antibody and not IgE antibody. Food allergy is also a protein made in the body, but it's IgE type. At least I'm not aware of cross uh, uh, increased prevalence of autoimmune condition and food allergy. Uh, so they're two separate, it's the same immune system, but the, the mechanism through which it manifests is different. Great, thank you so much for that clarification and that informative talk. Thank you, Dr. Shaw. Yeah. And I agree with your final statement there. Every food allergic person deserves freedom. And that's what we're striving to impart here at the Global Food Allergy Summit. So here you have Dr. Shaw's information. Yet another unique differentiator about the Global Food Allergy Summit is that we are providing you access to these experts. They want you to engage. They want you to follow up. We're going to, uh, again, continue to share these frequently asked questions after the fact. So next, we're going to move into our food allergy medical management strategies section. And our first presentation in this section is by Dr. Priya Bonsall. 
Uh, Priya is an allergist immunologist at the Asthma Allergy Wellness Center in St. Charles, Illinois. Dr. Bonsell studied at Penn, Pennsylvania State University, Jefferson Medical College, and, and has her BSMD program where she also earned her medical degree from the University of Illinois College of Medicine in Chicago. She completed her residency, was the chief resident at Rush University uh, Medical Center there. She's board certified in internal medicine, pediatrics, allergy, and immunology. She is a fellow and past president of the ISAAA, AAI, and a regional four governor uh, for the regional uh, allergy societies. She's also the chairperson of the Health and Informatics Technology and Education Committee for the Quad AI. She has assisted in the passage of state statutes on facilitating the availability and the use of epinephrine in Illinois schools. And she recently was awarded the Castle Connolly Exceptional Women in Medicine Award for 2020 and Top Doctor for 2021. So um, let's welcome Dr. Bonsell. We'll get this playing in just a moment. It worked in rehearsal. <laughs> See if it works live. First video presentation. Thank you um, so much for joining. We are so excited to keep going with the Global Food Allergy Summit. I'm Dr. Priya Bunsell. I am um, from the Asthma and Allergy Wellness Center out in St. Charles, Illinois. Um, and I also am on faculty of Northwestern Feinberg School of Medicine. And I thought I'd start out with this, um, with a graphic kind of, this is one that I just took actually this past week. And this is hometown right here of Chicago. And you can um, kind of see the sun coming up. And that's how I feel about uh, the food, aller uh, food allergy realm. I feel like we're starting to see some sunshine and starting to see some hope um, radiating uh, radiating out uh, with these food allergy um, guidelines as well as the research. So I'm privileged to uh, be able to share some of this with you today. So in terms of disclosures or anything, uh, there are absolute and uh, let's right, get right into it. So what do we worry about um, in terms of at-risk groups, right? So who are our, are our most vulnerable in terms of at risk for food allergies? We know that infants with severe eczema are at the highest risk of food allergy. Mild to moderate eczema, the family history of atopy, meaning that you've had um, one or both parents that have some kind of allergic predisposition, whether that be eczema, um, allergic rhinitis, asthma, some type of atopy in one or both of the parents, or infants with one known food allergy are potentially at a higher risk of food allergy, or if they already have one, developing another one. So there's no evidence at all to clearly support that the younger sibling of a peanut allergic child is at increased risk of peanut allergy. And I know, you know, um, we, we get a lot of the families in coming to the clinic and say, oh, you know, I, my, this child is allergic, so I don't want to give this other child um, peanuts at all. But like, there's not clear cut evidence to be able to support that. But these infants can be at risk of delayed peanut allergy with that delayed introduction of peanuts. So I know um, some of us that are very savvy on the call, we probably already know this and say, oh, I know this information has been flipped on its head. But others of us are like, wait, 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 we were told not to introduce um, peanuts, but that's actually, like I said, not the case. The delayed peanut allergy can stem with a delayed introduction in this group specifically. So I was trying to find um, a great way to summarize this, and I was lucky enough to come across uh, the consensus statement that recently came out of all uh, of quite a few of the randomized um, controlled trials for the early introduction of allergenic foods. 
And since we are going to have a whole separate session coming up about LEAP, uh, I am not going to go into the specifics of LEAP. But you can see here, we've got the LEAP trial in the UK, we've got EAT, uh, STAR out of Australia and STEP. We also have BEAT and studies coming out as well out of Germany and Japan. So, and all of these are looking at these particular, um, uh, particular groups. The first couple studies that we can see on the top, LEAP, LEAP and EAT, are focusing more on high-risk infants. And like I said, we just defined what that high-risk infant group looks like. It's moderate to severe eczema and or egg allergy in the LEAP study. And here in the EAT study, we ended up seeing, okay, what about these standard risk infants that were exclusively breastfed until these allergenic foods were introduced? Then we went on, you can see this middle column here is about a particular type of intervention. What did we want to, what did we do in the study? The next column is the outcome, what happened, um, what are we looking for? What was the primary outcome that we're trying to measure? And then lastly shows what the results were for those particular studies. So going across, looking at LEAP, we're seeing that these high-risk infants were given three times a week consumption of two grams of peanut protein versus complete avoidance at four to 11 months of age through 60 months of life. And what happened to the peanut allergy by that 60 months? So clearly we showed that there was a higher prevalence of peanut allergy in the avoidance group versus the 1.9% in the consumption group. And this was, um, and like I said, we're gonna go into this fully, but it was a major, um, major breakthrough because many of us, um, it was uh, funny, I was just talking a minute ago how all of us were told no, 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 um, no peanuts until they're age four. And so for a lot of us, this said, wait, we were just told the exact opposite, and now you're saying the opposite. So yes, now it is very much different that we do, especially for these high-risk infants, want to introduce um, peanuts early. Afterwards came about um, inquiring about tolerance or the EAT study. And like I said, they looked at these um, standard, um, standardized risk uh, infants. In one group, they had an uh, early introduction group where they introduced two grams of protein twice weekly at three months of peanut, cooked egg, also cow's milk, sesame, white fish, and wheat. And then the standard introduction group at the regular six months um, above six months food. What they were trying to figure out is what happened with food allergy to at least one of the six allergens at age one and three based on an oral food challenge. So it, it showed no difference in food allergy between the early introduction um, and the standard introduction. However, when we went on and did further analysis, we saw that there's less prevalence of peanut allergy and egg allergy in this early introduction group. So once again, really focusing on um, the, peanut, the peanut and the egg and the early introduction. Then let's move on to the STAR and the STEP trials. So here, STAR, we're looking at high-risk infants to moderate to severe eczema, uh, STEP, intermediate risk, atopic moms. And over here in the first one, looking at daily consumption of egg versus placebo powder from four to eight months of age, and given 0.9 grams of raw whole egg powder and cooked egg at eight months. We were trying to figure out what the impact of egg allergy is on the skin pick chest as well as the oral food challenge. This, this study, unfortunately, was terminated early because a third of the patients reacted to egg at, at entry at the oral food challenge. At 12 months, 33% had egg allergy in the egg group versus 51% in the control group, which was not significant, which is really this. So then when we went back and we looked at this, we said, uh oh, so if this is happening, um, is there a difference, right? Is there a difference between egg versus looking at the powder? So here, this is in step looking at the starting time for that peanut protein. So infants with no allergic disease or atopic moms, we had daily consumption of egg versus placebo powder from four months to six and a half months and 0.9 grams of raw whole egg powder daily. There wasn't unfortunately any significant difference between the egg allergy between the groups, but this particular group when we're using the powder, 
is not having any anaphylactic reactions at the initial egg introduction. Let's move on to then BEAT. BEAT had an intermediate risk, so infants with first degree relative with A to P, infants with negative skin prick test results, daily consumption of egg versus placebo powder at four months with 350 milligrams of protein, raw daily oral egg protein. Again, we're looking at sensitization to egg. And they found that the subjects in the egg group versus placebo had significantly leg, less egg sensitization. And there was no harm here in doing it this way with egg introduction. So going on, you can see, like, obviously, we are seeing that in this high-risk group, the themes are that it is okay and it's recommended to go ahead and introduce um, peanut protein at a younger age. And obviously, we can talk about, like, how, you know, the comfort level in the clinic, outside of the clinic. But it is recommended in those high-risk infants as well as seeing the trends towards introducing that um, egg, the, the whole raw egg powder, or um, trying to also mediate egg allergy, especially in these high-risk infant groups. So when we try to compare this across the board, so you're gonna see, again, we saw a lot of the studies were in Australia, we saw the NIAID um, recommendation and the British Society. And actually after this paper came the YACI, which is a European um, algae uh, guidelines. And basically if we compare ours, the, the NIAID guidelines, it says infants with severe eczema, egg allergy, or both should have age, should have introduction of age appropriate peanut containing food as early as four to six months to develop peanut allergy. The second addendum is that mild to moderate eczema should have age appropriate peanut containing food around age six months in accordance with family and cultural preferences to reduce the risk of peanut allergy. And lastly, infants without eczema or any food allergy, they can have age appropriate peanut containing foods freely introduced in the diet together with other solid foods in accordance with the cultural, pra uh, preference, uh, cultural practices and family preferences. So again, here in the US, that's traditionally how we are approaching now the early introduction of peanut. Now here you'll see in the British society, they talk about exclusive breastfeeding for the first six months. Um, hen's eggs should be differentiated from other complementary foods. And um, talking about the deliberate exclusion may increase the risk of allergy. And once these foods are introduced, again, keeping it in with the usual diet and the preferences of the family. Looking at the Australian guides, it says not before four months, but at around six months, start introducing various solid foods while continuing breastfeeding and be given peanut butter, cooked egg, dairy in the first year of life. So similar themes, but you can see globally, um, again, just because the conference is global, we're trying to see, okay, what are the nuances that are going on throughout the world? So what about how do we um, introduce these different types of foods? Like, I feel like uh, peanut has been very clear. You know, we've been able to see the LEAP guidelines. People have talked about those. And, you know, I'm going to go on to that in a minute to talk about Bamba and some other things. But what about some of these other foods? Because that's where I feel parents are like, well, if I want to try this before a year, how am I supposed to do this? So we're not saying to go ahead and run and just do like cow's milk for somebody who has milk allergy. So if you haven't given your baby infant formula, suggesting to start with milk in baked foods or, yo or yogurt, cheese can be given around six or seven months of age. For the egg, fully cooked or baked egg to start with, like we're looking at low sugar cookies, muffins, pancakes, rather than going to the straight eggs, which like we showed you before, have led to some reactions in previous studies. Undercooked eggs, definitely not recommended under H1. Looking at soy, um, if you offer the baby, um, you know, ideally it would be like soy milk, soy yogurt, tofu. You're not looking at soy sauce. So obviously best to avoid that. For shellfish and fish, over 700 uh, species of fish and shellfish in the sea. So we're not going to say, let us try every single fish, right? <laughs> so recommend giving the baby a few portions of fish or shellfish species that you intend to eat as a family. So if you're not normally eating it, 
again, no reason to stress yourself out and be like, oh, I have to have them try this immediately. No. <coughs> we want to make sure that you go with, again, what your cultural or family norm is, something that you tend to eat and what you'd like to continue to eat, and not giving more than two portions of fatty fish per week. And this is according to the FDA guidelines and the Food Standards Agency in the UK. Sesame, um, again, trying some hummus or tahini, sweets or candy can be given to older children, but obviously watching the sugar content. But uh, that would be a great way to go ahead and, and, and try um, sesame. Wheat, I feel, is a little bit more intuitive, looking at softly um, cooked pasta, which makes, you know, great finger foods. Also looking at those baked goods, which are also going to uh, work for your egg introduction as well. So going back and trying to look at, okay, in the U.S., when are peanuts and eggs recommended? So peanut is recommended to all infants starting at around six months of life, but not before four months of age. Once that peanut is introduced, it should be eaten regularly. We want to introduce eggs or egg-containing products. Like I said, we're going to start with those baked goods at around six months of age, but not before four, using only the cooked forms and avoiding raw pasteurized egg-containing foods. These foods, the people are always curious, oh my gosh, this has to be the first thing. No, this is not the first thing you try, okay? So you may try like other fruits. Um, you could try um, other vegetables, other greens, oats, rice. Other things should be tried first. And then we're going to try to incorporate these things in as well. And obviously, uh, you are going to know when your um, child and your family is ready. But these are kind of general guidelines to help you start. We do not recommend deliberately delaying other complementary foods. So if we're looking at cow's milk, soy, wheat, tree nuts, sesame, shellfish, fish, again, not looking at deliberately trying to hold it out a couple of years. Trying to nice, uh, and we're going to talk about that in a second, why we're doing this, but we want to nicely round out um, that diet, and we could there could be some potential harm in delaying that introduction. After the complementary foods, we want to try to diversify the diet. And why is this important? And, and we, many of you have probably seen um, multiple talks. I mean, this has been going on all across the globe where, where there's um, a lot of buzz here about why we want to diversify the diet to help foster that food allergy prevention. So you do introduce these other foods, but we're still trying to give the fruits, the veggies, the other grains, and keeping a well-balanced, well-rounded diet. Uh, the use of hydrolyzed formula. So if someone says, well, should I just use hydrolyzed formula to prevent food allergy and not breastfeed or not try to diversify? That is also not recommended. It is also not recommended to exclude common allergens during pregnancy and lactation um <clears throat> to prevent food allergy and you know this has gone back and forth through the years all across the gamut i've seen people say um i went the opposite i ate everything under the sun i have i went the i also met women who said i didn't eat any of the common allergens again we want you to eat what's comfortable with your culture with your norms but do not deliberately exclude these common allergens during pregnancy and lactation to try to prevent food allergy uh, I put this slide in because this slide um, was, and I know it's kind of tilty. I know you're not off kilter, uh, but this was, I had gone to uh, Yaki um, out in Prague and I was speaking about early intervention in pediatric allergy and uh, saw the lovely slide, lovely talk with Roadwit3 and all uh, looking from the Allergy Journal in 2019 talking about exactly what we were saying, the diet in early life and its influences. So you can see here on that picture, we've got yogurt, we've got fish, we've got some vegetables, some fruits. What's the point? And you've seen a lot of um, buzz about the short chain fatty acids, right? So the short chain fatty acids are going to reduce that allergic sens sensitization. We have, you can see the effects of butyrate up to six years out, showing decreased atopic sensitization, decreased asthma, 
and decreased food allergy. So even though our natural inclination may be, oh no, I don't want to give this particular food to my child, it's very hard to sit there and we want to try to fight that inclination. Um, even if we've had another child that has food allergy and do want to try to diversify that diet, especially early in life, because we can see not only just the implications at that moment in time, but looking out up to six years later. If we're trying to figure out how many peanuts, I think this is where um, there's confusion. And you know, I had some help being able to get this, uh, the Bamba graphic um, put into here. But uh, you know, um, some of the patients have come in and, and say, oh, I just give Bamba, my child eats a whole bag of Bamba. I'm like, that is fantastic. So 17 grams of peanut puffs is about two thirds. And this is what we're looking at, like two grams about three times a week for peanuts in that lead study, especially for that high risk uh, group. So that is about two thirds of a bag of Bamba. Nine to 10 grams of peanut butter is either two level measured teaspoons or a big round teaspoon. And then if we're looking at eight grams of ground peanuts, that's two and a half level measured teaspoons Four grams of peanut flour or peanut butter powder is two level measured teaspoons. So when you're trying to wrap um, your head around how much peanut, this should give you a good indication. So um, I had a family just come the other day and they said, well, I don't know, can my child actually have peanut butter because you put, the, uh, um, I said, well, are they doing any type of, um, Peanuts. They're like, oh yeah, they eat the whole bag of bamba. It's like, yes, for sure. You can see, you know, exactly how this correlates the whole bag of bamba compared uh, to the ground peanuts to the peanut flour. I wanted to make a point about this because this um, becomes a huge thing if we do end up having um, food allergy. And this is called food insecurity. So food insecurity, unfortunately, um, has been shown in the literature to negatively impact the effective management of food allergy, especially in these higher risk, underserved, lower income groups. Um, it really, truly, um, it's our job in the office as providers to screen for this. Um, but as a parent, I think it's really important for you to share and discuss with your product because maybe they don't realize. Maybe they don't realize what a difficulty it is for you to be able to read these food labels. Maybe it's difficulty in access um, from where you live. Maybe it's a cost barrier. Um, there's definitely a lot of barriers and you know it's difficult to understand, okay, well, if I have this, can my child eat this particular food? And the hard part is if we don't open that discussion up and we don't keep it open and um, we say, okay, if you're nervous to try it, let's try it in the office. Let's do something so that you're not so insecure so that that child and that family has more security and has co a confidence. I do hope that we can address these factors and then help to change outcomes so that people are not so insecure and then if at a later point, if we finally say, okay, we're ready to do that oral food challenge, I've seen some children, I mean, they're terrified, absolutely terrified to do that food challenge. So how, you know, how did this, this didn't come about overnight, right? This came about from years of being told not to do it, but also difficulties in understanding what some of the foods and what is, what is secure for that. So, um, I did want to bring this up because of how important I believe that uh, food insecurity is and how big of a role, how big we need to address this. With that being said, there is so much excitement in the area of food allergy. So obviously we have talks here that are going to go on about oral immunotherapy, about epitaneous, about sublingual. Um, we are going, you know, there's biologics. Um, that uh, have been coupled in the studies with omalizumab and the anti-IL-33, and obviously quite a few more that are in development. Uh, there's been discussions of probiotics, prebiotics. Um, there is also uh, a Chinese herbal medication um, concoction where they are working on. 
Uh, they are also they have also looked at the CNA lev vaccine. So it's early on in um, so far in my trials, but obviously expanding from like from the lab, but currently in the lab at the moment or, or just getting out of the lab where uh, if you give the particular vaccine, it is those uh, within a couple of weeks, those might don't have food. So compared to years ago where it was only, oh, you have to avoid it or, oh, you have to carry epinephrine, but I don't have the money because the epinephrine is ridiculously expensive. There is so much development um, that is up and coming. And, you know, the wonderful thing is all the providers here are more than happy to link you, help you get access to that therapy. Um, and obviously the Aspen ALG Network, there's huge resources here to be able to help connect you. Um, and so I feel like this is, this, this is where truly our passion lies as providers, because this is where we feel like, hey, we can change the course, right? Even in the realm of epinephrine, there's been advancement. So when we look at, um, when we look at EpiPen or AviQ or the generic or Adrenoclick or any of these, that's been kind of the mainstay for years and years. Like I did some of my fellowship training on trying, uh, or some of my fellowship papers on, um, training and teaching epinephrine and how much people retain it. But we are also seeing development, obviously, of these nasal sprays. So ARS Pharmaceuticals, Rin Pharma, they're working on nasal spray epinephrine versions. So you may see um, the Nephi device you may have seen online, um, as well as the Brin uh, version. Uh, the Nephi version gets to a peak concentration in about 30 minutes, um, as well as the Brin getting in about 20 minutes. Um, Aquestic Therapeutics in uh, New Jersey is creating a sublingual. So it's almost like you get the little glycerine um, breath strips. They dissolve when it's put on the tongue and then the peak concentrations within 15 minutes. So once again, you know, we are entering this realm where there's going to be novel ways. So, you know, even when I teach epinephrine, I do make a very big point about it is not a big jab. It is not what you watch on TV, right? So if that thought occurs for you to take it, we do want you to use that epinephrine. Um, so I tell people, if that thought even crosses your brain, use it, you know, and um, use it early, right? We're not sitting on it. We're not waiting. And I think that um, some of the advancement that we're seeing in this realm is going to give us that confidence too, to be able to use that epinephrine early because we're not shying away because of that there's only a needle available. So this is lining us back to where uh, we're all gathered today, right? So we're all, uh, this was when I was uh, back in DC a couple of months ago for the practice management meeting. And, um, you know, you can clearly see, like for me, just like the first one represented the sunshine over Chicago, this one is representing for me all of the hope um, that we're all having gathered here today in the, in, um, in all of the developments and all of the research and everywhere that food allergy is going. And the fact that now we have this huge network, right? We have each other to talk to, each other to lean on, and each other to share our you know, share our failures sometimes, as well as share our successes with. And I thank you so much uh, for taking your time today and being a part of this program. And um, I hope I can help answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Bonsall. I think we have Dr. Bonsall online to answer a few of the questions that have come in to the chat over um, her presentation. So let me see here. Okay, first question, if we've got her audio on, All right, we're ready. Okay. I think, Bonson, um, can, you can, you, can, you, can you, yeah, I can hear you. Can you guys hear me? Awesome, yes, sounds great. Okay. I know my video, so, my video stopped. I don't know if you guys want that or, I'm not I sure, okay. but I've got the audio. Okay, yeah, I'll I think get we're okay. Um, okay. So um, the first question, is if a young child has a number of food sensitivities and allergies, is it recommended to reintroduce some foods in hopes that they might outgrow that allergy? 
I'm, I'm always a huge proponent in the clinic to reintroduce whatever we can, you know, and as long as we're doing it safely and you're doing it in conjunction with an allergist, um, you know, because a lot of us have done, you know, obviously the ones, especially here who are on the call or, uh, you know, doing the program, we all, um, we're all believers of trying to help people uh, manage as well as trying to help uh, so-called quote outgrow, right? Outgrow your allergy. And sometimes it's hard. We don't just want to treat, um, the, I don't just want to treat your lab value or I don't just want to treat your skin test, right? So I'm going to go off of your clinical history, look at what your reaction was, look at the numbers and then think about it and say, okay, and make a calculated risk. Okay, what am I going to do? And then obviously, if we think it's okay, then I'll challenge you in the office. Or if I think you can do it at home, I'll let you do it at home. Uh, so for me, that is a conversation with your allergist. And especially if you have those multiple allergies, trying to reassess those and not, um, you know, because I've heard some um, families just giving up, unfortunately, for years and years, or they don't come to the out. They're like, oh, we were told we could never have this allergen for 10 years or for the rest of my life. And and I think things are evolving in food allergies, so I don't think that's necessarily the case. So I would be an advocate of working with your allergist to try to figure out what you can eat. Yeah, I think that that is. I actually think that's a very important point that we need to make about all of the, even the chat that's going on online. You know, we are not here to give very specific medical advice or diagnosis. The point of this summit really is to support those living with food allergy in their food allergic journey to support the medical community ha who has interest in this topic, um, but not to provide individual medical advice or diagnosis or treatment advice. So I think that's a really important point that you bring out, Dr. Bonsell. Um, next question is how do we, how do results differ between adult versus children in regard to reintroduction of peanut, egg, and milk? Uh, you know, I don't necessarily, I know that some people, um, you know, heavily differentiate. Obviously, we know that there are certain ages where you can outgrow, uh, uh, quote, outgrow, you know, particular allergens. Um, and, you know, they have these set ranges. But I never give up on an adult. Like, I had an adult even um, probably a couple of weeks ago in, in the mid-20s, or mid-20s, early 30s. And uh, they had told me the same thing that, oh, no, I was told I could never have this again. And I said, that's completely not true. Why don't we find out where your levels are? And then you have to let me know if you're ready to work with me and we can do a challenge. So I do, again, feel like it comes back to that individual level. Um, obviously, with children, parents are very motivated. So they come in and they bring their child. You know, if I say, hey, can you please follow up in a year or two? They do. Adults often just get lost in, because I think they're frustrated with their food allergy and they're just used to not having it. But as you saw, there's so much innovation in this space. I don't believe that we should let our adults go either. I know it's harder for adults, you know, in terms of um, being able to outgrow particular allergens, but I still think it is worth the effort to talk with an allergist and try to figure out uh, what our options are. Okay. And the next question is around current guidelines for mothers of infants who are at high risk for developing food allergy if breastfeeding can't be accomplished. Um, any specific um, thoughts around those non-breastfeeding moms and, and introduction of foods? Yeah, I mean, I think that's where it goes back to we're looking at the whole gut microbiome and uh, we, you know, how we showed that side of like we really making sure that you're trying when you're introducing, you're not restricting. So maybe I'm going to start with a food, a vegetable, a grain, something to start with. And then I'm going to start using those guidelines and start building my repertoire to say, okay, at six months, I'm going to start introducing peanuts. And then I'm going to start introducing um, some of these other foods, because I know I have this huge atopic history. And that comes to more, especially if you have the high risk infant with, um, severe eczema, those are the infants that we're going to push a little bit more for these introductions and also keeping a um, well-balanced, very complementary um, food diet. Yes. Well, thank you, Dr. Bonsell. We'll appreciate that update on uh, food allergy guidelines and the research and, and the developments in this space. Um, so we're going to move on to our next presentation now, which is Dr. Manvid Segal. Dr. Segal is an allergist immunologist who treats asthma and allergies. 
Great. thank you um, so much for joining. We are so excited to keep going with the global. So oh, sorry, trying to get both uh, recorded and live con coordinated. Sorry about that delay. Um, so now again, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Segal. He's an allergist and immunologist um, who treats children and adults at his Winmore and Center City Philadelphia offices. He's been recognized as a top doc in Philadelphia and has been featured on a number of news outlets as well there in his local home city of Philly. He's the first allergist in private practice in Pennsylvania to offer for oral immunotherapy to successfully treat food allergies, including milk, egg, peanut, and tree nut. He's one of the first doctors in the region to introduce allergy cluster immunotherapy to treat seasonal allergies and provide that faster track to well being for patients. Board certified uh, by the Academy. American Academy of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology, and the American Board of Internal Medicine. He's Chief of Allergy and Immunology at Chestnut Hill Hospital and is also on staff at Thomas Jefferson and Methodist Hospital. So welcome, Dr. Segal. Thanks. Um, my name is Manav Segal. It's a real privilege to be here and talk to you. And I'm really glad that the presentations here started with a why. Um, I think, um, you know, I actually did my fellowship with Dr. Jones. And in 2015, Dr. Jones had already been doing oral immunotherapy for uh, three or four years. He was successfully treating patients with a wide range of food allergies. And um, his why became my why not. So. <laughs> And I think what is really empowering for patients is not whether they choose to treat their food allergies, but they're empowered to make a decision about how they want to approach the issue. So just because uh, an individual can be desensitized to a food doesn't mean it's the right choice for every uh, patient or family, but I see people leave uh, with the weight lifted off their shoulders, whether they're talking about themselves or their um, children, when they know that they have choices. So uh, my presentation is going to be about um, discussing potential severity of allergic reactions. So allergic reactions to foods can vary from mild to severe. And whether symptoms are going to develop is pretty predictable. I mean, if you're allergic to a food, you're going to have an allergic reaction if you eat it. And in fact, the types of symptoms that might develop from an exposure could be similar to previous reactions. But my take home message with regards to severity of reactions is that the clinical progression of a specific allergic reaction and the severity of an individual allergic reaction is what's unpredictable. So symptoms could range from an itchy mouth, maybe just from some cross contamination, but they could be life threatening from larger ingestion. A common question I get is whether measured skin test size or serum IgE levels uh, for a particular food can predict the severity of a future reaction, and unfortunately, that's not the case. Skin tests and serum IgE levels, as we've learned, only confirm the presence of antibodies that recognize the allergenic protein, uh, but they're not helpful in predicting the severity of reactions. Oh, yeah. use it for me. Thank you. Great. Great. Thank you. So um, uh, the, the type of food an individual is allergic to can also impact the severity of reactions. So more severe allergic reactions tend to occur to foods, including peanuts, tree nuts, seeds, fish and shellfish, than let's say to uh, fresh fruit and vegetable allergies. So this BJ is an example of a real case. And as an allergist, these are stories that we hear every single day. So BJ was a patient I saw just within the last few weeks who tried cashew for the first time. He was a four-year-old brought in by his parents. He had seasonal allergies. He had a history of eczema, but he had no known history of other food allergies. 
And within minutes of eating just one cashew nut, he developed eyelid swelling, lip swelling, and cough. He developed diffuse hives. He was taken to the emergency room where he received epinephrine. BJ had an anaphylactic reaction. Anaphylaxis is defined as a serious allergic reaction that's rapid in onset and may cause death. So there's several ways to clinically diagnose anaphylaxis. One is if you have an acute onset illness involving skin or mucosa and either profound respiratory symptoms or reduced blood pressure, that by itself is a definition of anaphylaxis warranting treatment with epinephrine. Another clinical definition of, of anaphylaxis would be something we're more familiar with, which is someone with a known history of food allergy that's likely eaten the allergen and then develops two organ system involvement. So again, they've likely eaten the allergen and then they develop either skin or mucosal tissue involvement, such as rashes or hives, uh, respiratory compromise, uh, reduced blood pressure or associated symptoms or persistent gastrointestinal symptoms. So again, likely eaten the food and um, some combination of two organ system involvement. A third way to clinically diagnose anaphylaxis would be if someone's been exposed to their, uh, the food that they're allergic to and had a drop in blood pressure, uh, that by itself meets the clinical criteria for anaphylaxis warranting uh, treatment with epinephrine. But as you can see, there are over 40 different signs and symptoms associated with allergic reactions and anaphylaxis. Cutaneous symptoms occur in about 90% of episodes and symptoms can include flushing, itching, hives, and swelling. Respiratory symptoms occur in about 70% of episodes, symptoms like nasal discharge, nasal congestion, change in voice quality, uh, choking sensation, or uh, uh, cough, wheezing, or shortness of breath. Gastrointestinal symptoms occur in about 40% of episodes, symptoms including nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, or crampy abdominal pain. And cardiovascular symptoms occur in about 35% of episodes, including dizziness, tachycardia, hypotension, or collapse. This is a uh, slide just representing the typical clinical course during an allergic reaction. You have allergen exposure, initiation of uh, symptoms, um, peaking of symptoms, and resolution of symptoms, hopefully after treatment with epinephrine. This is an example of a uniphasic reaction. In an estimated 20% of cases of anaphylaxis, the clinical course results in a biphasic reaction. Again, you have allergen exposure, but you have development of symptoms, initial improvement of symptoms after treatment, but then development of a second round of symptoms necessitating treatment. The severity of symptoms during the biphasic reaction can be as severe as the first round of symptoms. Risk of biphasic reaction is among the reasons patients are recommended to go to the emergency department following an allergic reaction. ER visits allow for clinical monitoring between two to eight hours and administration of other supportive treatments. Uh, things like IV fluids, oxygen, and steroids if necessary. Rarely individuals can experience protracted symptoms of anaphylaxis. In this case, symptoms don't respond to individual doses of epinephrine and an epinephrine drip and ICU monitoring may be needed. Protracted anaphylaxis can be associated with uh, poor prognosis. Um, severity of allergic reactions remains unpredictable, but certain factors can contribute. There are certain medical conditions that lead to more severe reactions. So uh, comorbidities or underlying conditions, including asthma, cardiovascular disease, being on beta blocker medications or underlying systemic disorders, including conditions like mastocytosis. It's not necessarily a comorbidity per se, but I also consider being a teenager uh, to be a risk factor for more severe reactions. <laughs> being a teenager contributes to poor decision making all around. <laughs> not reading labels, not admitting to having food allergies, ignoring symptoms, avoiding seeking help, um, delaying treatment, and not having or not using epinephrine. 
Certain cofactors can increase the severity of an allergic reaction. These are variables. Uh, they're among the reasons allergic reactions are unpredictable. Cofactors to anaphylaxis include exercise, menstruation, uh, non steroidal anti inflammatory drugs, alcohol, elevated body temperature, acute infections, and antacids. Diagnosis of anaphylaxis is made clinically. Some danger signs for more um, severe reactions include rapid progression of symptoms, respiratory distress, including wheezing, increased work of breathing, persistent cough or stridor, uh, persistent vomiting, hypotension, dysrhythmia, chest pain, or syncope. Acute management is epinephrine. So epinephrine is the first and most important therapy in anaphylaxis. There are no absolute contraindications to epinephrine in the setting of anaphylaxis. That means there are no reasons not to use epinephrine. There are many physiologic benefits to epinephrine that counteract the events that occur during an allergic reaction. During an allergic reaction, blood vessels dilate. Epinephrine helps blood vessels to constrict again. During an allergic reaction, blood pressure drops. Epinephrine raises blood pressure. During an allergic reaction, mucosal tissue like that in the throat swells. Epinephrine decreases mucosal swelling. During an allergic reaction, airways constrict. Epinephrine is a bronchodilator. Epinephrine increases heart rate and force of cardiac contractions. Epinephrine even stabilizes allergy cells called mast cells and basophils and decreases histamine release. So you can see epinephrine is the ideal antidote to symptoms that develop during an allergic reaction. The sooner it's administered, the more effective the results. And delayed administration is among the reasons for poor outcomes. So in summary, anaphylaxis is defined as a serious allergic reaction that's rapid in onset that can be life-threatening. The clinical progression of a specific allergic reaction and the severity of an individual allergic reaction is unpredictable. Lastly, epinephrine is the first and most important therapy in anaphylaxis. And I just wanted to thank you for your uh, time and attention. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Segal. Wonderful. Um, so whenever we talk about this particular topic um it, again i as i said in the opening comments some degree of subjectivity right around is it a mild reaction is is it a severe reaction um we have often you know gone to that if it's more than one system in play act right it, what is what's the prag, pragmatic practical advice you give in with patients trying to determine is it mild? Do I need to, you know, or is it something that I actually have to, to use epinephrine? Because we know there's a reluctance to do so with uh, the current route sure, of administration. Sure. I, I mean, I really like bears, um, food allergy, um, and anaphylaxis um, sheet, which outlines indications and uh, reasons to use epinephrine. And um, they make things pretty black and white in terms of the types of symptoms that would uh, necessitate epinephrine, uh, many of which we touched on, including respiratory symptoms, cardiovascular symptoms. So again, as we talked about, there's different ways to define anaphylaxis, but if you've, like, if you've eaten the food and you feel lightheaded or dizzy, those would be reasons to use epinephrine. There are no reasons not to use epinephrine. And in some ways, um, you know, when we perform oral challenges and if a, a patient has symptoms, and even if they're mild symptoms, if we end up using epinephrine in the office, it actually ends up being a good thing because it reassures the patient uh, that epinephrine works, uh, it works quickly, um, that it's not painful, um, that the um, benefits in terms of how quickly they feel better outweigh any sort of um, adverse symptoms that they may uh, experience. And um, so I'm just saying that um, um, ha use of epinephrine is very, very well tolerated. It works very quickly. And I'd rather have a patient use it uh, uh, at the onset of symptoms um, um, rather than wait. It's the delayed use of epinephrine that creates problems. 
uh, the further the reaction progresses, the less likely it's going to be uh, uh, be effective. Uh, one other take home message since I have the opportunity is patients associate using epinephrine with going to the emergency room. In fact, they won't use epinephrine because they think, okay, if I can manage this without using epinephrine, then I don't have to go to the ER. And I try and remind the patient they're going to the ER because they ate something they're allergic to, <laughs> not because they used epinephrine, all right? And that there are no downsides to it and that um, they're gonna feel better faster. Um, so- That's an important point of just alleviating that, you know, myth or misperception about the use of epinephrine. That, it's not the use of epinephrine that is the recommendation to go to the ER, it's actually the ingestion of Food, right. The, the risk of a secondary reaction, right? Correct. Um, what, whenever we talk about this, we also cannot um, talk about this without touching on the use of Benadryl. Um, and I shared it in my opening story. Uh, you know, I know it wasn't the best, but it was the best I had at the moment. Uh, but oftentimes we hear patients who, go, who their go-to is Benadryl at the first sign of reaction. Um, can you speak about why they're that's not a good idea and what the risk associated is. Epinephrine addresses the symptoms that develop. Um, uh, you know, I think um, one thing that we, and uh, patients know firsthand is not all allergic reactions are the same. So there are certainly circumstances where someone has had cross-contamination and they have mild symptoms. The body has its own um, endogenous ways and its own production of adrenaline that's going to help alleviate some symptoms. So, you know, under some circumstances, that clinical picture that I drew, which was allergen exposure, uh, development of symptoms, and resolution of symptoms is going to occur um, with or without treatment, uh, but it's the risk of severe reaction um, that scares all of us. And um, it's really why we need to be aggressive in terms of uh, treatment, not delay treatment or wait for things to get better on its own. And I think Benadryl is really just uh, waiting to see what happens and um, that's, that's not what you wanna do. One final question before we move to our next presentation. Um, and that is, what would you recommend for an adult patient with Hashimoto's regarding the dosage of epinephrine? So there are, um, comorbidities that do increase uh, adverse effects associated with epinephrine. So uh, some of those could be underlying medication use. Um, Hashimoto's thyroiditis could be a circumstance where the side effects associated with epinephrine could be greater. But, you know, we're describing a circumstance where um, you're faced with a choice and you're faced with risk versus benefits. So I would say the short-term risk associated with epinephrine uh, without uh, um, the benefits to use would outweigh any um, uh, potential short-term risk associated with the Hashimoto's. And if you're having an allergic reaction to the food, you should administer epinephrine. Yes, we always say, if, you're, if the question is, should I give, you should have already done it. Yeah. <laughs> if there, that consideration is epinephrine. Should I give epinephrine? Absolutely. Thank you so much. Great job. Thank you. I appreciate that. In order for us to stay on time, we're going to continue through the program um, and into our next presentation. Okay, so our next presentation is a recorded presentation by Dr. Nicholas Papadopoulos. Um, Nikos Papadopoulos is a world leading expert in allergy and asthma, focusing on the role of infection and its interaction with atopy as keystone events of the allergy pathophysiology, as well as targets for treatment. In the course of uh, Dr. Papadopoulos' career, he's identified some of the key mechanisms leading from common viral exposures to asthma exacerbations and allergy persistence. He's professor and head of allergy at the University of Athens and is also the honorary president at the University of Manchester at OPRI Singapore. He supervised more than 20 PhDs, organized over 100 educational events, trained doctors throughout the world, and invited speaker at international events more than 30 times a year. 
Um, he is the Editor-in-Chief in Frontiers of Allergy and Associate Editor of Clinical and Translational Allergy. So we are so honored to have Dr. Papadopoulos uh, from Greece. He is an amazing advocate, and I have enjoyed working with him both U.S. and abroad. And now we're going to hear from him about maternal diet impact. in Manchester, UK, and in Singapore. And here in the next slides are my disclosures. I don't think they're related in any way with the content of this talk. But I will have to start with uh, the expectation management because uh, starting from quite some time in the past, there have been promises that one can consume a food or a potion and somehow magically he will get completely healthy or he will get over any of the problems that they might have. And lately with the digital media, with internet, with social media, you have this attitude intensified. So basically you can find over the internet with Google, any kind of food that people claim that's magic and of course this is really difficult to compete with because science has to go through specific steps and needs to be certain in order to say that you can use this approach either a food or a medicine or whatever for treating or preventing a condition however magic in, uh, you know promises everything to happen instantaneously we have to be very careful and to make a long story short I don't think that we can say definitely that there is something that links maternal diet and, and food allergy, but I will take you through the whole story. Starting from the elements that make this question really very complex and not so straightforward to answer. It's not about you know, eating peanut or not eating peanut. And we start with the first element of complexity, which is time. So when are we uh, thinking about having this food eaten or not eaten? Is it during pregnancy? Is it before pregnancy? Is it after pregnancy? Is it throughout uh, the time, all the trimesters? So because the timing and uh, the, the rhythm is different, this makes things quite complex. And of course, then we have the concept of ingredients you might have a good ingredient, something that will help you prevent allergy, for example, or any other disease, but also you can have a bad ingredient. And there's always the challenge of the balance. And not only just the balance of ingredients, but overall the composition of a diet is hugely complex. And we now identify different patterns, for example, the Mediterranean diet, which does not include only specific ingredients but also the rate that we eat them the style that we eat them and you can have for example you know eating raw food or eating slowly different aspects that make, make the diet different so this uh, is more modern but of course it suggests that it is very complex to um, answer to the question whether a specific type of food or diet will uh, have an effect on food allergy and then, of course, it's predisposition. And predisposition, not only for a disease, whether one has a disposition of the genes, for example, and is more susceptible to become allergic or not, but also whether they are more predisposed or less predisposed to interact with a certain food. So it might be that a person might be more susceptible to uh, the effects of a specific ingredient rather than another person. And this goes towards personalization, which makes things highly, highly complex. Finally, we need to think about outcomes. And this is a very important point because the topic of the talk is about food allergy, but we all I think that we all agree that it's not only about food allergy, but it might be about overall health and different types of allergies. It might also be an overall health. So who would want to avoid one type of condition in order to get another type of condition? 
So it is very important when we look at the evidence, whether there's something that will generally help us become healthier or whether there's something that will be particular to a specific disease. And now we get specifically into food allergy. Food allergy, we all recognize, is an important problem, something that affects the lives of many, many people around the world, and particularly in cases where food allergy is severe, is life-threatening, it influences very much the quality of life. On the other hand, what is very important is that food allergy is a relatively uncommon condition. And when I say uncommon, in comparison to other allergies like allergic rhinitis or asthma. And in fact, what's important is that there are at least 10 times more people who think they have a food allergy rather than the ones that actually have if they go through the, um, the medical procedure in order to evaluate and diagnose it. Of course, people who think they have food allergy also have uh, an effect on the quality of life. However, uh, when the different research and studies are done, then these people do not count. So when we actually try to identify what produces or what helps or what uh, stops food allergy, then we're talking about the real thing, which is relatively rare. And for this reason, in fact, we need to take into account the different phenotypes, the presentations, which are many, because food allergy is not one condition, is a set of conditions depending on food, but depending also on mechanism. And what is very important is that it appears the ma in the majority of cases within the general context of allergy, of Ig mediated allergy, of direct allergy, which means that people who have food allergy very often in the majority of the cases would have atopic dermatitis or eczema, would have allergic rhinitis, they would have asthma. So these outcomes, these conditions are much more prevalent and they go together. So the majority of studies that I'm going to present to you later on have looked into the effect of diet on allergy in general, but not necessarily on food allergy or on a specific food. The reason being, as I mentioned before, is that when you focus on a specific proven food allergy, then you have a much, much smaller sample to be able to identify uh, the cause and the effect of the problem. And just very shortly, I want to share with you some uh, ideas, some thoughts, some information about how allergy develops. I'm not gonna go into very many details of the mechanisms, but I want you to understand that every time that the immune system encounters an antigen, encounters a structure, it poses a number of questions. And the first question is, is that structure, is this antigen, is it me, is it itself? Because we do face, and the immune cells face every time, every, every day, many, many times, uh, self-antigens. So if it's me, then I don't have to do it. Then I need to be tolerant against myself. And this happens with a number of mechanisms that we know of. If it's not me then, however, we need still to decide what to do with this antigen. And then the question is posed whether the antigen that the immune system sees is harmful or not. So if the antigen is not harmful, which is the majority of cases, then obviously, again, we need to develop tolerance. We need not to have an immune response against it. However, if the antigen is supposed to be harmful, then we need to mount an immune response and destroy it, kill it, remove it from our system. So we generate specific cells. So when this decision is taken, what is important is the local environment when it's happened. This can happen in the skin, it can happen in the gut, it can happen in the respiratory system when all the different uh, antigens come in. And it's very important what the local environment is at the time when the antigen is presented. And we know now and we understand that if the environment where this contact happens is inflammatory, then our immune system understands that this might be harmful, might be dangerous, and this promotes allergy. And this is important for a discussion uh, further on. So there are many aspects around diet, 
uh, and uh, the relations between diet in women and their offspring. And one question that has been posed by the Aki Task Force, an important question, is whether diversity in diet or the quality in diet during pregnancy may affect different allergy outcomes in infants. So they looked into the availability of different studies and they have looked into different possible outcomes and they found out that most of the outcomes that were studied were asthma, rhinitis, eczema, but not food allergy. And unfortunately, there were not no data specifically on diet diversity, but there were some data on specific diet patterns, for example, the Mediterranean diet. And here you had one good study of good quality that showed that this Mediterranean diet could be protective for wheeze and for allergy in general, for A to B, but not all the studies have proven that, have agreed. And then the other thing that I found is that any effects that they were identified was slightly more prominent when they looked at the infant diet rather than the maternal diet. So the conclusion for that is we don't have enough evidence. We do need to study much more. But on the other hand, it seems that for the allergies of the offspring of the child, it's probably the diet of the child that's important rather than the important the diet of them or the mother. That does not mean that the diet of the mother is not important, but we don't have so strong evidence on that. Then there was a systematic review that was done by the US Department of Agriculture, including 19 studies. And they tried to see whether there were associations between the specific foods, so they asked about specific foods, and the development of allergy and food allergy in the offspring. And they had basically three different categories. One was limited evidence, the other one was insufficient evidence or no evidence at all. And as you can see here, there was, they found some limited evidence showing that soy is not linked. So the consumption of soy in the mother is not linked to food allergy in the offspring. The evidence that they found for milk, peanut, egg and wheat was insufficient and there was no evidence for other foods. And there was also limited evidence that there was no link in regard to different foods for eczema and asthma. So very little data, which uh, highlights you know, both the complexity and the fact that we cannot be certain that any food can actually generate or protect from food allergy. And this is reflected in the guidelines, particularly when we have realized that previous advice to avoid food A or food B because of the potential allergenicity did not stand. The data was not good enough and it does not seem to have any link between the, the consumption in the mother and the development of allergy in the kids. So currently, practically all the guidelines do not suggest to avoid any kind of food in order to prevent food allergies. And this is particularly for nut, milk, egg, so the, uh, the substances that usually are associated with allergy in kids. Whether the mother uh, consumes them or not is related to the choices on, uh, on diet and not to the possibility of the child developing food allergy. But of course, as I mentioned, we need more studies, we need to try to explore associations. And here, Karina Venter and colleagues have actually tried to develop a new instrument, a new type of approach in order to explore these associations. And they used uh, information, they used data from a number of mother-child pairs in the US. And they developed an index, which is called Maternal Diet Index, which is based on different food consumption. And this index was actually being uh, able to was able to balance between the foods that were more prone to be associated with uh, food allergy in uh, with, with allergies, sorry, in general, in the offspring, and the ones that were associated with less. So there was some association there with allergy outcomes, but not food allergy. So what they have found is that consumption of yogurt and vegetables were associated with a reduced risk of developing different allergies, while fried potatoes, grains, meats, fruit juice, cereal were associated with increased risk. 
And I need to point out here that what we see here is association. It doesn't mean that this is the cause of these allergies. It's the fact that people who happen to consume, for example, yogurt or vegetables, are the ones that the children have less allergies. And it's quite possible that there are many other things that people who choose to consume more vegetables do, so that this whole attitude, this whole pattern might be associated with the protection rather than the specific food itself. And there are a few other studies, for example, I'm going to give you an example from a study coming from Korea, North Korea, uh, South Korea, uh, with about 2,500 um, mothers and uh, kids were there. Again, they did not try to evaluate specific foods, but rather diet patterns. And there were different diet patterns that they have associated. There was one specific pattern that was associated with sugary and baked products. So uh, pregnant women were consuming a lot of sweets, ice creams, et cetera, et cetera. And these also, it happened that in the same uh, group, they also consumed high trans fats. And this was in fact linked to an increase in food allergy to a considerable extent by about 80%. So it was almost doubling uh, of the cases of food allergy, again, an association. But what they have found is that this effect was evident in infants that have specific genetic markers, which includes one more element, the element of susceptibility, as I mentioned in the beginning, where it's not everybody that will have the increased risk, but if you have a genetic susceptibility and then it happens that your parent has a specific type of diet, then you're more susceptible. But it should be noted that these mothers also breastfed their infants more. So actually the way that uh, the effect of the diet happened either during pregnancy or afterwards is something that we don't know. And of course, as I mentioned in the beginning, it's not only about maternal diet during pregnancy, because maternal diet here, in this case, before pregnancy was shown that there is a possibility that by effect allergy and asthma. And this was more than a thousand mother-child pairs in France. They were followed prospectively, and they had answered food frequency questionnaires focusing on specific foods. And here, what they found is that there was uh, some relationship with asthma, rhinitis, and eczema, again, not food allergy, as I mentioned, because probably food allergy is a small number, it's a small proportion of these patients. However, vegetables, eggs, grains were associated with reduced risk of allergy, and meat was associated with increased risk. So I will here try to conclude saying that during pregnancy, we don't, we, we believe that there are no specific foods that can prevent allergies, but also no foods that can induce allergies. So the, the guideline is that women should not exclude any food expecting that this may prevent allergies of, of their children. Overall, what we see and where research is being directed and we need to put more effort is to describe the association between a healthy and balanced maternal diet and the prevention of different types of allergy, including food allergy. And this is very reasonable to happen because this healthy, balanced diet actually is associated with less inflammation. So less inflammation makes the environment in which any antigen is presenting more friendly and reduces the risk about the risk of developing allergies. So if you want to take away message is that please don't avoid anything or don't try or don't be convinced that if you have a magic food, then your child will not develop uh, an allergy. Eat more fruit and vegetables and nuts as is part of a healthy diet. Eat less meat. Try to keep your BMI between 18 and 25. Uh, eat slowly. So generally follow uh, the the ideas and the direction for a healthy diet. And this will, in fact, reduce the risk for children and the whole family developing food allergies. And with that, I would like to thank you very much for your attention.
Thank you, Dr. Papadopoulos. That was wonderful and really appreciate you joining us uh, online here. We do have our first question for you. So the question comes and says, what about the impact of maternal diet on the development of FPIs? So perhaps you just explain what FPIs is and then respond to the question. Yeah, so, so thank you very much for the, for the question. Uh, FPIs uh, stands for, for food protein induced enterocolitis syndrome, and it's a non IG mediated food allergy, uh, which means that you don't find these antibodies, the IG antibodies, they're not the cause of this allergy, but there are specific cells, and uh, you have uh, the clinical presentation of enterocolitis. Uh, it can be presented with uh, with vomiting and the diarrheas. So, uh, no, we don't. As uh, th this is even more rare than Ig mediated allergies, we have even less uh, data and level less uh, information. We haven't really seen that running in families, but in any case, we don't have studies that have shown some kind of association of FPIs. With anything else, actually, the only case that we have association with FIs is on cases where uh, we try to induce, which we try to push people with uh, some kind of uh, food in terms of desensitization. And there you can get either eosinophilic diseases or some types of uh, enterocolitis conditions. But uh, no, there is no way of protecting. And actually, uh, it is quite rare if you have an uh, FPIs that your child will also have FPIs. Hey, thank you. Um, so the next question is actually maybe a little bit related to the previous topic, but I think you'll be able to respond to it. Uh, and Dr. Papadopoulos, here in the U.S., we have these ready, set food commercial lines to introduce new foods to families or to high-risk patients. Um, any comment that you have about their ability to be helpful, to prevent, or uh, certainly to introduce early foods? And I know we'll talk about this a little bit more in the next presentation with Dr. Mack as well on early introduction of foods, but your thoughts? Yes, uh, well, I cannot comment on specific products because I'm not aware and don't know the details of the products, but I have the impression that these products are based on the principle that it is good to introduce uh, different types of potential allergen early uh, because that will increase the chances for developing tolerance. And it's just as if you were you know, doing the job right and you were giving all the different types of, so you were giving a diverse diet to your child and you were also having a diverse uh, diet. And so it, it is possible that these preparations can serve this uh, purpose. But of course, if you are planning, so if you do have a healthy diet within your household, they might not be necessary. Right, exactly. And I think that that's the important point is is in your talk regarding maternal diet and the impact, uh, but also on the early introduction is is whatever is culturally the norm and acceptable, a healthy diet for a healthy mom and healthy child introducing without those high risk factors. Thank you so much. Um, one final question about vitamin D during pregnancy. Is that an effective way to prevent food allergy in infancy? Well, not necessarily food allergy, but, uh, you know, having the deficiency of vitamin D can generate problems on susceptibility to infections, susceptibility to allergies. So it is good to actually have uh, levels of vitamin D within the normal limits throughout life and particularly during pregnancy. So it depends. So it's not for everybody to just take a lot of vitamin D. It's not some kind of superfood, but you should not be deficient in vitamin D, which happens to people that are not exposed to the sun, that do not eat foods that would contain uh, enough vitamin D. So, uh, yeah, uh, it, it's within the development of a healthy immunity. It's good to have normal levels of vitamin D. Excellent. Thank you so much, Dr. Papadopoulos. Uh, really appreciate your expertise in joining us 
today. We're going to move on now to our next presentation. Uh, and our presenter is Dr. Douglas Mack, and he's going to be speaking about the early introduction of foods and LEAP. Dr. Mack is a pediatric allergy, asthma, and immunology specialist, the assistant clinical professor in the Department of Pediatrics and McMaster, the principal investigator for Ontario Pediatric Allergy Research Cooperation. He sits on the board of directors of the Canadian Society of Allergy and Clinical Immunology and is on the executive for the section of allergy for the Ontario Medical Association. He's the co-author of Clinical Guidelines on the Prevention of Allergy, Epinephrine, and Anaphylaxis for the Canadian Society, and is the editor of the first North American Manual of Oral Immunotherapy on Food. We are so excited to have you, Dr. Mack. Thank you so much for making the trip from Canada, and we'll introduce you, have you to the podium now. Thanks. Thanks very much. And I think, you know, one of my whys, obviously, I think when we got into allergy, food just had so little guidance uh, to provide for our families, so little solutions. Uh, and I'll walk through that in a minute. And I think really uh, food was is an amazing um, topic because it's just exploding. And so I'm, I think this is, this is why we're doing this type of a summit because it is exploding. It is um, expanding and our knowledge base is just is just growing by leaps and bounds every year. So I, I'm I'm loving where we are, being able to help patients in new ways that just did not exist when we first started our careers. So this is a fantastic time. So thank you very much for having me. Um, let's move forward here. There we go. Perfect. So can we can we prevent food allergy? Um, and, I, and I think in many scenarios we can. I think there's a lot for us to learn, um, and I think that this is something that I that I think we have to have a bit of humility when we talk about this. And I think I'll, I'll walk you through why that is. Here are my disclosures. I don't think any of these um, are any significant conflict of interest for today. Um, so let's talk about what brings us to food allergy. So what contributes to a patient having food allergy? Because that, if if we can understand that. We can understand how can we prevent it, and, and and Dr. Jones and others have started talking about this um, to some degree, and Dr. Bansell as well, um, Dr. Papadopoulos as well. And clearly, there's a genetic component to the development of any form of allergy. You know, allergic parents. This is kind of a mantra. You know, allergic parents make, in general, allergic children. That doesn't mean that an allergic parent who has peanut allergy is going to make a kid who has peanut allergy. But the but the, the phenotype, this kind of atopic allergic tendency, is something that we do see inherited. Okay, so there is a genetic component, and that may be, be related to filaggrin, as Dr. Jones had mentioned earlier in, in this summit. Um, so there's a, there's a, certainly a strong link between having that mutation, which is by the way a skin protein um, that predisposes them toward, towards eczema, and now having food allergy. There, the hygiene hypothesis, I think, is a, is a great one. I think this is a, um, we, we've seen this for, for years, uh, that the children that are growing up on farms don't have allergies to the same degree as people who are living in the city. Um, as we westernize the world, one of the best examples was Eastern Germany and Western Germany. When that wall came down, the rates of allergy and food allergy was much lower in Eastern Germany compared to the West. It was a great experiment, and we see this in, in other parts of the world as well, that, you know, I, I would be out of, out of work, <laughs> I would not have a job in many countries, but in, here in the Western world, where we are, hot, we are so hygienic, where we sanitize everything, and I have Purell in my bag, I, I'll, I'll tell you right now, it's sitting there, but the reality is, our hygiene may affect it. And it isn't just whether I clean my hands, it's clean drinking water, it's, it's antibiotic use, it's all of these things that contribute. Now, many of these things are very positive for our society, but can be harmful. Vitamin D, as, as, as has been mentioned earlier, some nice studies showing that the further you are away from the equator, the higher your risk of, of actually requiring an EpiPen, epinephrine auto injector prescription um, or having anaphylaxis admissions, Australian data and North American data supporting this as well. Obviously the gut, I mean, and I, I think the gut is something that we are just getting into. I, I look forward to 10 years from now when we, when we can isolate that bacteria and say, okay, yes, this is the one we need to get to prevent that. But I think that's still a few years away, but it, does, it is an important part of how we look at the development of any of these allergies and, and, and potentially how we treat them as well. I love the dual hygiene, the dual exposure hypothesis. And I'm going to walk you through this. Okay, and this is important. On the, this is a baby with eczema. 
And what this hypothesis put forward was that a baby with eczema does not have intact skin and therefore may have exposure to an al food allergen just from crawling around on the ground. We have peanut allergen in our houses or wheat allergen or, or sesame or whatever. It's, it's in the dust that we have in our homes. And if a patient only exposes, is getting exposure to this through the skin, they can develop an aberrant immune response, which we call a TH2 or an allergic immune response. Now, if that same patient who has eczema gets that food orally, either before or simultaneously with the cutaneous exposure, they can develop proper immunity to this that is not allergic in, in, in nature. And that understanding, I think, is so key because when we look at delaying the introduction of food in patients who have eczema, we get the cutaneous exposure without the oral exposure. And I think this is one of the key reasons that we are heading down this track of early exposure and early introduction of foods. Probably it's a perfect storm of everything that we've just talked about. And we're going to, you know, there's clearly not one reason why we have a rise in food allergy, but there's probably a combination of all these factors that we are talking about today. And I think when we, I'll, I'll leave it at that, there were guidelines put forward by the AAP back in 2000. And the AAP meant well, but we had very little data to support the statement. So at that time they said, we'll eliminate peanuts, tree nuts from mom's diet, egg, cow's milk, fish, and perhaps other foods from the diets while nursing and withhold dairy products until a year, eggs until two years, peanuts, nuts until three years of age, very prescribed. But the problem is there was very little data to support this. This was largely personal opinion with some very, very limited data. Um, and then as you may know, back in 2008, the, the AAP did a 180 on this and said, well, actually, maybe we don't know exactly what we're doing. And there was a bit more of a humble response. And I, and I think that was spurred on by other countries, and I'm happy to provide an international perspective on this. Um, you know, other countries were saying, well, maybe the data isn't there, and maybe we shouldn't be so prescribed. And, and part of this arose because we've seen this before, Bamba. Okay, in Israel, Bamba is a weaning food for many babies. They are given this food. It is like a very, very soft Cheeto without the cheese. It has peanut powder in it. And these babies get this as a weaning food because it dissolves so instantly in the mouth. In fact, you can, you can, if you go to Israel, you can find this on the streets. You can, you can get it. It's, and it's delicious. I love this stuff. Um, and, and, but, and, but it is just bes it, beside the chips. It is, but it is something that is commonly ingested and, and the significant ingestion at an early age drastically differed from in the UK. So what they did is they looked at a study um, of Israeli Jews and Jews that were living in the United Kingdom. Now, the United Kingdom, they were, they were in general recommending avoidance of these foods, so the peanut ingestion in babies was low. What you can see is that in the, in the UK, the rate of peanut allergy was, was about tenfold higher than it was in, in Israel. Now, clearly, we have different countries. We have different vitamin D levels, different levels of exposures, et cetera, et cetera. But it drove the hypothesis that potentially the amount that these babies were getting at an early age actually contributed to them being protected in Israel compared to the avoidance standard of care in the UK. Back in 2013, we put forward a position statement that suggested that, they do, that, that families do not delay the introduction of any specific solid food beyond around six months of age because data like this was accumulating, but we didn't have great firm data to say firmly that this was a, the, the best approach. Um, and we said that later introduction of peanut, fish, or egg does not prevent and may even increase the risk of developing food allergy. But what we were missing was a randomized controlled trial. This is the highest level of evidence that we can find um, in, in one of the highest levels of evidence, I'm sorry, that we can find in the field of medicine. Um, and this was published in the New England Journal. This, in my career, is probably one of the biggest articles that we're ever going to read. Landmark. It's completely changed my approach, everyone in this room's approach, and the approach to prevention of food allergy across the world. And what they did was a very, very simple experiment. They took children that were at high risk for developing peanut allergy between the ages of four and 11, and they did two, they did two, two things. Either the patients were given the standard of care at the time, which was strict avoidance, or they were given peanut on a regular basis of about two grams, three times a week. That's it. 
Now, amazing that this family did this for five years. They actually, they, they stuck with this program, this approach for five years and they continued through. And at the end of the day, they brought these kids back to the clinic and said, okay, now we're gonna give you a whole pile of peanuts and we're gonna see who's allergic. What you can see here is that the children that were given the avoidance strategy had a significantly higher risk of developing peanut allergy than the, than the active group that were actually introduced peanut at an early age. So basically what we're saying is we had an 80 to 85% reduction in the development of peanut allergy simply by doing the exact opposite of what our guidelines said at the time. This was very difficult. And, and I think this is something that we have been coming to grips with for years, seven years out, and we're still trying to figure out how do we implement this? And how do we deal with the lack of trust that has, has arisen from families and from other practitioners when for years we were saying, avoid, avoid, avoid. And I don't think we have all the answers. And I think that this is, this is a, an important part of our, our, our story here. I don't think it's the entire story. And I think we still have a lot of things that we need to sort out. And I think when I see families in my clinic, one of the first questions that comes to me is, doctor, I've heard this data, but I, do I need to test my kid before introducing peanuts? And, and I think there's a lot of approaches. And I'm happy to provide an international perspective on this. And, and I think the question is to test or not to test. And children in general are not like little adults. Are unfortunately, we have very, very poor predictive value. We have very no normal values for, for skin tests and blood work for infants at the age of six months of age. So what we do is we extrapolate from older individuals, which may not be actually all that accurate. We, as has already been discussed by Dr. Shaw, there are many false positives and false negatives already in the field of allergy. And in infants, it may even be more significant. Now, what is really tricky here, and I think this is something to really grasp, is that delays that are associated with um, with waiting for the consult to get tested, getting the blood work, getting the skin testing, and then potentially coming back to the office to introduce peanut, that may take months, as you might know. You know and, and I think this is, not a, this is not a quick process. Certainly in Canada, it may take a little bit longer than in the, in the United States. Um, but that delay is not significant. And that delay may actually be the, be the, be the difference between developing peanut allergy and preventing peanut allergy. So I, I, we take a very different approach as we've kind of wrestled with this and in the past. In other countries, like in Australia, in fact, Australia, as, as Dr. Branso was talking about earlier, actually says, we're not testing, get peanut into these kids. And what they found, this is amazing. I love this abstract. On the top, you can see in between 2007 and 2011, less than three in 10 infants were introducing peanut before the age of one. After they introduced those guidelines saying, just get it in, nearly nine in 10 infants were introducing peanut into the diet but, but before the age of one. And this is within one to two years of introducing a set of guidelines based on this. Very, very simple, no testing, just get it in. It's something we've struggled with for many, many years. I don't think there's a right answer, depending on the patient that we're dealing with. What we know is that in office and even virtual introductions can be supported, but most can be done at home. And so what we actually did during the COVID pandemic when we couldn't get kids into our office to introduce these foods is we offered it virtually. We would support families where they would kind of do it with us online. The reality is the vast majority of these kids did extremely well. And in fact, what's interesting actually in the LEAP study is that in the patients that introduced peanut early, there were no cases of anaphylaxis. Can you guess which group had anaphylaxis? the group that avoided. In early infants, we know that the risk of reaction is very, very, very low, and that fatal reactions has never been reported. And I'm going to just say it, put it out there, because that's what we're all concerned about. We don't want our kids to have a severe or fatal reaction. In fact, in the Australian data, there was only one patient who had potential anaphylaxis, and that patient went on to actually pass a food challenge at 14 months. So probably they actually did not have a severe reaction to begin with in the first place. So in general, for infants, this can be done very, very safely. Eggs is a bit of a mixed story. There's, as, as Dr. Bansell was talking about earlier, there are, about, there are five studies looking at egg allergy prevention in early introduction. This was one that showed a substantial reduction in, in um, egg allergy by early introduction, but the other studies are not quite as strong. And I think we're left with a bit of a mixed story here. Certainly many of our patients may benefit from this, um, but in general, our, uh, this is where part of our, you know, our mantra of early introduction starts to fall apart a little bit. 
um, we have compiled a table of kind of what we do know based on the level of evidence. And certainly peanut at the top there is beneficial for, for prevention. In the middle, you can see that egg is probably beneficial, but we just don't know quite how much to give, how early to give it, and what is the dose that we need to give. Milk, we have a number of randomized studies that are of mixed quality. Um, and so we, the rest of the wheat, milk, sesame, seafood, shellfish, et cetera, we really don't know. Same thing with tree nuts and soy. And this is something I think that is really challenging for us because now we have one peanut, one randomized trial for peanut. We have um, two for milk, five for egg, and one for a mix of foods. And we have some mixed results. The best one so far has been for peanut. We have very little to do with tree nuts from a prevention perspective, but this was a study that looked at that the prevalence of, of tree nut allergy and nut and seed allergy in European populations. And they show that obviously that there was a high degree of, of coexistence of a number of these food allergies in these patients. But what was really amazing, and if you look there at the top, that age was a significant predictor of multiple food allergies, and thus the secondary spread of nut allergies occurred in older children. What this means is, that these children that were avoiding tr the tree nuts because they had the word nuts in their name actually developed further food allergies simply during the avoidance process. And, and I see this on a regular basis, that kids come in, they have negative skin testing. They come back two years later, they haven't introduced the food. The skin testing is now two to three millimeters. They come back two years later, now it's six or seven. They come back another two years later, it's 10 millimeters and these kids have anaphylaxis. And I think this is something that we see clinically and we're seeing it in, in now in European studies as well. I'm waiting for the randomized trial. Finally, I think one of the, the questions that was brought up earlier is whether to consider conventional versus commercial uh, introduction. There are commercial products that are out there. Um, some families like the convenience of that. Um, surely conventional products where you simply give them peanuts, you know, let, them eat, let them eat cake, uh, let them eat peanuts. Peanuts cost peanuts. They're literally cost, cost nothing. They're very inexpensive, whereas commercial products are more expensive. Um, some families like the fact that they don't have to prepare. They don't have to think about it. They know that they're getting what their kid needs at an early dose. So there's, there are pros and cons to this that we published just recently. Overall, we, have some, we don't have great data to show whether these are effective or not, but in general, there is some data to support them. Finally, the questions I think that we need to look at are, are all foods the same? Clearly they're not. And I think this is something that we, we are wrestling with all the time. For example, why in Israel is sesame allergy so high when they introduce um, sesame early? Are siblings at greater risk? If you were to ask physicians across Canada, what is the number one risk factor for developing peanut allergy? It's family history. When in reality, it's one of the weakest risk factors for developing peanut allergy. In fact, as Dr. Bansell had mentioned, Probably the avoidance that is occurring in homes where, where children have a, a, another sibling with peanut allergy leads to the development of avoidance in the, second, in the secondary sibling, and unfortunately that can lead to the development of peanut allergy, and there's lots of data to support that. Do we really need to test? What dose do we give? I mean, two grams of peanut protein is, is about eight peanuts. That's a lot of peanuts for these kids to get on a daily, regular basis, but what do I do if I have to eat peanuts? and almonds and hazelnuts and walnuts and cashews and everything else, these kids are going to be just full of nuts. And that is reality. It doesn't make any sense. How long do we give the food for? Do we have to eat every food? And then finally, as Dr. Wasserman um, and Dr. Carr are going to talk about what happens if they still develop an allergy, because despite our best efforts, kids still develop food allergy. No matter what we do, it isn't just early introduction. There's a perfect storm happening. As Dr. Jones has said, this is a, the real pandemic and it is happening. And I think the, the, the challenge that we face is how do we humbly advise our families to help them prevent and treat these allergies? Thanks very much. Amazing, Dr. Mack enjoyed that. So the first one, is there any research that you're aware of comparing pasture-raised chicken eggs versus supermarket eggs specifically? Hmm. I can't think of it specifically. I can think of some data with raw milk, uh, but I can't think of any data with eggs specifically. Yeah, good question. Yeah, I, yeah. I, yeah I, don't, I can't remember anything I've read yeah. either. And no. I see others here in the room shaking their head yeah. the same. Yeah. So. It's a great question. Great and I, question. And I, let's do a study. 
yet another question to be answered. All right, what are your thoughts about sanitization during COVID that mm. result COVID result in a spike of food allergy in new generations? This is that, fascinating. Yeah. That's a great, great question. My colleague, Dr. Jonathan Hurahain in the in Dublin um, is actually researching this. So he has a cohort now that is looking at um, what is going to happen with these babies. And he's enrolling about a thousand babies um, early on and is going to look at that specifically. So stay tuned. We will have good data, I hope, to support that. But you're right. COVID is just, you know, a, another, it's a natural experiment. You know, yeah. we're, we, all of this is an experiment. And this was a very good experiment that just was thrust upon us. And so hopefully we have that data soon. Absolutely. All right, one final question before we have to move on. Is it possible for a parent with food allergies to prevent having a child with food allergies? Absolutely. And I think once again, um, the perception even amongst physicians is that a familial a parent family history or a sibling family history is, is actually a major risk factor and it does not appear to be. And I think the most important thing in that scenario is to get counseling on how to safely introduce that. We get it. We want mom and dad to be safe. We want the other children to be safe. There are ways to introduce these foods safely to prevent the one child from having an allergic reaction and to ensure that the other one can develop proper tolerance at an early age. It can be done. It can be more complicated, but it can be done. Thank you very much. Really fascinating, I, you know, so I, um, part of my why uh, as well beyond Carson is, is the next generation. I, I said earlier, I'm the mother of five. I became a grandmother this past year. So I have a 10 month old grandson, Brentley, who's already exhibiting symptoms on the allergic march. And uh, we've had this whole conversation about early introduction of foods and what should we do and, you know, high risk and low risk and all of this. So I'm going through this with my own family now about, you know, when to introduce foods. And, and I really appreciate that perspective. Great job, Dr. Mack. All right, so our next topic is one that uh, quite honestly can be a bit controversial. So oral immunotherapy, goals and risk. And we have a panel presentation, as I said before, a little bit of a pro and con, two different perspectives from uh, Dr. Richard Wasserman and Dr. Warner Carr. Uh, let me do their introductions and then we will turn it over to Dr. Wasserman first. So Dr. Richard Wasserman is the Medical Director of Pediatric Allergy and Immunology at Medical City Children's Hospital in Dallas. He is a member of Allergy Partners of North Texas. He served on the faculty of Southwestern Medical School for 27 years and after attending Hobart College, Mount Sinai School of Medicine and Southwestern Medical School, he trained at Children's Hospital of Philadelphia and the Rockefeller University. He opened a private practice and research group in allergy and immunology in 1988 and has written and co-authored more than 150 publications. So we're excited to hear from Dr. Wasserman, who has a wealth of experience in oral immunotherapy for food allergy. Next, Dr. Warner Carr. Dr. Carr is board certified in allergy and immunology as well as internal medicine, and his stated philosophy of care is, quote, with my specialized skills in the treatment of asthma, allergic rhinitis, food allergy, eczema, and other allergic disorders, I'm able to help my patients get better and return to full and active lives. Dr. Carr completed his medical school at the University of Washington and his fellowship at Walter Reed Army Medical Center in Bethesda and spent time serving our country within the FDA uh, regulatory body as well. So they will talk about both FDA approved and unapproved approaches to oral immunotherapy in these two presentations. So let's move forward. And our first one here is, as I said, by Dr. Wasserman. The Medical Director of Pediatric Allergy and Immunology at Medical City Children's Hospital in Dallas and the founder and director of the Dallas Food Allergy Center. And my mission in the next few minutes is to talk about the risks of OIT. Um, my only disclosure is that I have been a consultant for Immune, and uh, <clears throat> as you might expect, uh, the risks of OIT initially 
center largely around uh, allergic reactions. And allergic reactions are what pretty much everybody is concerned about. Uh, allergic reactions during OIT uh, range from mild oral itch that goes away all by itself without treatment or with maybe a glass of water or a few crackers uh, or a single or a few hives uh, on or around the lips, uh, usually caused when the food does not go directly into the mouth and is really more of a contact um, reaction. And then uh, there's always the possibility of a significant reaction that might include widespread hives, uh, nausea, abdominal pain, or vomiting, uh, uh, nasal or eye symptoms, or uh, swelling of the eyes uh, or about the face, uh, cough, wheeze, a shortness of breath, a sensation of throat closing. And when several of these occur at the same time, uh, that's anaphylaxis. Uh, uh, <clears throat> I want to emphasize that although some kind of allergic reaction is uh, common uh, during the course of OIT buildup, that is from the very first dose until you reach the target dose of OIT, uh, <clears throat> these are overwhelmingly mild, uh, self-limited uh, problems that uh, go away by themselves in a few minutes. Um, in our uh, experience uh, with um, peanut OIT that we published in 2014, uh, epinephrine-treated reactions occurred about one per uh, thousand doses during the escalation period uh, and about two per 10,000 doses uh, during maintenance. Uh, we learned a lot in the past eight years, and I think our rate of serious allergic reactions is lower than it used to be. And um, most uh, people go through uh, OIT without needing to use epinephrine. Now, uh, I just noted the rate of these uh, acute allergic reactions. Um, most of these reactions occur within 30 minutes of dosing. In fact, in our uh, Dallas Food Allergy Center, where we've treated more than a thousand patients, um, we have never uh, had an acute reaction occur beyond 30 minutes, uh, which is why after dosing, we observe for 45 minutes. Uh, but uh, actually out uh, in the field at home or, or wherever, um, reactions still <clears throat> mostly overwhelmingly occur immediately, uh, but can be delayed uh, as long as four hours. That's rare and unusual, um, but it can occur. Um, and so just to put that in context, uh, we don't think that uh, a patient needs to be observed directly for four hours uh, after dosing, um, but people should be alert to the possibility that a reaction could be delayed that long. Now, the majority of these reactions uh, occur for no apparent reason, uh, but there are things that uh, a parent or a patient can do to increase the likelihood of an acute allergic reaction. Uh, and most OIT physicians have dosing rules uh, that they uh, recommend uh, that be followed when the dose is given. Um, you need to dose with food in the stomach, either a heavy snack or a meal. Uh, you need to limit physical activity after dosing. And that doesn't mean you have to sit in a chair the whole time. Uh, your toddler isn't forced to to be uh, put in a chair for two hours, uh, but you wouldn't want to take a child out uh, to play soccer uh, during the two hours after dosing. Uh, our experience has been that dosing too late at night also increases the risk of a reaction. And so we strongly recommend dosing prior to 8 p.m. And then failure to uh, 
hold the dose or adjust the dose for illness. Uh, that is a, a cold or other viral infection is a risk factor for reactions. And so we have a, a flow sheet or an algorithm that we provide our patients that guides them on what to do when there's a fever uh, or when there's an asthma flare. Um, because dental procedures uh, like teeth cleaning or um, orthodontic appliance adjustment um, loosen the teeth a little bit and um, kind of open a, a portal uh, in the mouth for the food to go in. Um, we modify dosing around dental procedures. And then there have been reports of uh, teenage girls who've had problems with reactions around uh, menses. Uh, this is very uncommon. And among our thousand patients, it's only occurred a handful of times. Uh, so uh, by following the dosing rules, <clears throat> uh, you can minimize the risk of these acute allergic reactions. Now, the, the most common uh, uh, side effects of OIT relate to abdominal symptoms. Uh, and these symptoms can be um, very mild uh, sensation of unease or abdominal pain, nausea, vomiting, or diarrhea. Uh, the vomiting is an important sign and understanding the significance of vomiting is important so you know how to deal with it. Um, vomiting that occurs during dosing while the food is being taken is almost always caused by aversion to the taste. That is the, the patient just doesn't like it and it has a hard time getting it down or sometimes the texture is problematic for them. So immediate dosing during, uh, immediate vomiting during dosing um, is uh, just a sign of that problem and not an allergic reaction. Uh, and uh, we tell people to allow the child to calm down, uh, rinse their mouth, uh, have something that they like to eat, and try dosing again um, 10 or 20 minutes later. Uh, however, vomiting that occurs uh, a few minutes after dosing, up to two hours after dosing, is uh, probably an acute allergic reaction, uh, like the kind of reaction that I've already discussed. Uh, <clears throat> now, vomiting that occurs two hours after dosing uh, is, uh, we believe, caused by uh, a syndrome that um, we reported and named uh, ELORS, E-L-O-R-S, for eosinophilic esophagitis-like OIT-related syndrome. And in our experience, this may occur in as many as 10% of patients. The risk factors for ELARS are higher food-specific IgE, older age of the OIT patient, and a history of eczema. The and, uh, I'll say a little bit more about what, how ELARS shows up in a moment. Um, the treatment for ELARS is to significantly reduce the dose. Our standard is to cut the dose in half and hold for that reduced dose um, for a period of one to three months. Uh, almost always reducing the dose makes the problem go away. And most patients after this holding period are able to uh, reach their target dose after resuming um, their OIT updosing. Now, frank eosinophilic esophagitis is a biopsy diagnosis. And um, we very, very rarely send our patients uh, to GI for uh, an endoscopy to make that diagnosis. It certainly has been uh, reported, uh, and it's possible that if someone has ELORS and pushes through in an attempt to continue on without a dose reduction, um, they may develop eosinophilic esophagitis. Now, ELORS, uh, this is uh, our first 54 patients with ELORS. And as you can see from this graph, 
uh, almost 80% of them had vomiting, um, slightly over 50% had abdominal pain, about 10% had nausea, uh, and then the other associated uh, complaints. Maybe that the low rate of heartburn uh, is because um, when ELORS occurs in toddlers or young children, they don't know how to describe heartburn. Now, uh, in addition to these physical uh, risks of uh, OIT, there is also the potential for psychological uh, problems. Uh, a substantial portion of peanut OIT patients don't like the taste of peanut. Um, we have some uh, peanut OIT patients who, when they're able, run right out and get a Snickers bar or a Reese's and um, they go on their merry way. Um, but a fair number uh, of patients really don't like peanut. And this can occur with really any OIT food. Um, taking a food every day is boring and it's hard for, for many children. Um, and so aversion to the OIT food is a problem. Rarely uh, a child becomes oppositional and um, may develop aversion to other foods other than the OIT food. Uh, <clears throat> other psychological problems include, include an increase in the family focus on the patient and on food, which is kind of the opposite of what we're going for. And there is always the possibility of worsening a pre-existing eating disorder uh, or inducing an eating disorder uh, or worsening pre-existing behavior problems. During the shared decision-making progress uh, process before the start of uh, OIT, uh, families should share with OIT physician any psychological problems that may uh, be pre-existing uh, so that the physician can uh, incorporate thoughts about those into the plan. Um, it's uh, also OIT has the potential to worsen anxiety in the patient. You've been telling this child not to eat the food forever, and now you're saying it's going to be okay to eat the food. That often creates some anxiety until you get through it. Um, parents and other caregivers are anxious about dosing and the possibility of a reaction and having to use epinephrine. Uh, and this anxiety may happen at the time of dosing and in some circumstances leads to generalized anxiety. Uh, and involvement of a, a professional, a psychological professional uh, is often very helpful here. And unless there is uh, a good agreement among family members that OIT is right for this patient, uh, it's possible that the OIT may worsen or even create family discord. Now, everyone who considers OIT should understand that it is a burdensome therapy. Um, regardless of how it's exactly done, uh, initially, at least, it requires many office visits. Uh, those visits may disrupt uh, work or family life. Uh, the dosing itself may disrupt the patient's life. Uh, adjusting the dosing timing either to very early in the morning before school or activities or in the evening after dinner. Uh, dosing may be a problem, especially because of the post-dose activity restriction. And this is especially true for the older middle schoolers and high schoolers who are very involved in athletics. And there is the financial burden uh, of treatment, the cost of treatment, uh, the physician's fee, and for the commercially produced product, uh, the cost of the product itself, uh, the cost of travel, uh, and the cost of missed work. And I've already mentioned uh, family discord, which is part of the burden of care. Um, despite all of these risks, 80% of our OIT patients uh, achieve uh, their target dose. It's still a little bit of work. She does not like it. She eats peanut M&Ms and 
that every time we come to see Dr. Sugarman, he asks her if it's worth it, and every single time she says yes, absolutely. So, uh, <clears throat> OIT, considering uh, having your family member be involved with OIT certainly has risks, and you have to be aware of those risks, uh, but for the majority of patients, uh, the outcome is a good one. Uh, thank you for your attention, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Dr. Wasserman. We're going to move right into Dr. Carr's presentation, and then we'll have Q&A after that for both. Oh, I said we were. All right. Hello, hello everybody. Uh, Warner Carr here. Um, I'm out here in, in Southern California. Sorry I couldn't make the meeting and, and be in person, but it really is my pleasure today to talk to you all um, about OIT. And I'm going to focus mostly on the goals of OIT, and Dr. Wasserman is going to focus on his presentation on the risks. And then I think afterwards we're going to have a little uh, uh, question and answer, and I should be live for that one. So again, my name is Warner Carr, and um, I, I've been doing OIT for quite some time now. This is my disclosures. These are companies that I'm currently either a speaker or a consultant for. And really what I'm going to talk about is goals. And what is our primary number one goal with everybody with food allergy is to decrease the risk of an accidental reaction. So somebody gets an accidental exposure and then they have anaphylaxis. That is what scares everybody. And that is the primary goal, I think, for all patients and families. Uh, however, we, some of these goals we can build on. We're, we're going to talk today a little bit about what bite-proof means, free eating, carrying epi, whether or not we need to do those things. Um, but the bottom line, number one, most important, is we want to protect these patients, both adults, and children in the event that there's an accidental exposure and reaction. So what is this concept bite-proof? You know, it's funny, I think uh, there's a lot of different definitions of, of bite-proof, but just to be simple, it's if they bite something that has peanut in it or they eat it uh, and spit it out um, <clears throat> or eat it and swallow it, that, that they don't have a reaction. So how do we know how much we should be giving and, and how do we know when we've achieved that? If you look at the, the study that we did um, with the FDA approved product uh, that we published in, I believe it was 2018 in the New England Journal of Medicine. I'm one of the investigators for, for that um, product that's commercially available now. I don't really use it in my practice, but I did the studies. Part of the clinical trial was to do randomized, double blind, placebo controlled food challenges, which we did in every patient. And what we found was that the average patient had a positive food challenge somewhere between 10 milligrams and 30 milligrams, just depending on which food challenge before or after therapy. Um, now, uh, the after therapy group obviously would have been in the placebo group because we know the treatment worked. So about 10 to 30 milligrams is where the average person will have a food reaction in that study. The average dose on an accidental exposure is somewhere around 120 milligrams. I mean, it can be more or less, but let's just use this as an example. So bite proof would have to be more than that, It'd be more than that, um, and that it would have to also be a high enough dose that we could induce uh, some type of immunologic tolerance or desensitized state. So in my practice, in my clinical practice, I still use peanuts or you know peanut flour or something equivalent to this, and because of you know, uh, variability between one peanut and the next peanut. I don't use just one peanut kernel. I mean, an average peanut kernel is about uh, 1,000 milligrams and a, a, about, you know, 250 to 300 milligrams of peanut protein. But there can be variability. So in my practice, I try to have the minimum dose as two, uh, just because of that variability. And to be honest with you, I really try to push the bite-proof people 
uh, to four. The issue is uh, food aversion, and I think that Dr. Wasserman is going to talk a little bit more about risks and stuff like that. But this definition is a little bit fluid. I think if you talk to 10 different uh, food allergists, they'll give you uh, 11 different answers because somebody changes their mind. But anyways, each patient is a little bit different, um, and, and you guys know the adaptability that we need to have with regards to our goals. Some people want to be bite proof to start, but as they move along, they want to free eat. Some people want to free eat at the very beginning, but then they realize they have a horrible aversion to the food, and so then they just want to be bite proof. So what about this concept of free eating? Uh, again, free eating, uh, as it states, is a patient can eat with no restrictions. Um, in my practice, we use a top dose of eight grams of whole peanut. If you do the math, that's around uh, 2 to 2.4 uh, uh, grams of peanut protein. After we achieve um, the top dose of 8 grams, we have our patients enter a six-month time period of maintenance, and at the end, a minimum of six months, sometimes longer, quite commonly longer. But with a minimum of six months of maintenance, then we bring them back and we do a triple dose challenge. So we do a, a 24 gram um, a challenge just in one dose. Then I tell my patients, you can now free eat up to 24 grams. Uh, but the problem is, is when you read a label, it, it gives the amount of the protein. So it's hard when reading labels because the other thing is it doesn't tell you, uh, let's say there's something else in there. Let's say there's chocolate or another nut or some other food product. On the label, it just tells you the total protein content. So you don't know, you can't break it up on which food protein it is. So I just tell my patients, don't exceed that roughly 7.2 grams of total protein during that day. Um, and I just want to bring up this concept of the desensitization curve, because I talk about this a lot with, with my patients. And basically what that's talking about is essentially, you know, the, the higher the dose, the, the, the quicker or the steeper of this desensitization curve, when we can get people to free eat, so to speak. Um, so you can get there with a lower dose. You don't have to go to eight grams. It's just since this, the slope of the curve isn't as steep, let's say with four grams versus eight grams, it takes longer uh, to achieve that goal. Um, and I, I just always remind my patients that this is not a race. It is a journey. It's highly customizable. Um, but in my patient population, it's usually three to five years before I'll do alternative dosing um, uh, or, you know, where they can free eat perhaps twice a week. I do have a handful of patients that um, I've just told, um, you know, just, just have a peanut butter jelly sandwich on a Tuesday and a Friday. These people are unusual. Um, they, they have all gone to zero on their skin test and their blood test. Uh, and those are the people that I also start talking about activity as well, like no, no need to limit activity and so forth. So let's talk about some of the other goals that people have. Food allergy is a big issue, as each of you know, with regards to quality of life. It's a huge issue. Not only does it affect the patient, it affects the parents, and it affects everybody in their sphere, their siblings. I don't know how many times I've had a sibling say, I'm so happy that we did this, Dr. Carr, because now I can eat this food. I want to eat this food. Um, the entire extended family. So normalization or improvement in that, kind of taking away some of that food anxiety. I like to tell my patients, as we treat your food allergy, so will we be treating your food anxiety. So that's another goal. And that, this is really an important goal, normalization of school and social life. Improve self-image and, and, and self-confidence. Uh, like I've said, it, you know, it affects the whole family. So when we get to the point where the rest of the, when the siblings can now start eating the food they've been avoiding, you, it can diminish some of those family tensions. Um, and we like to start younger in our patients. Uh, you know, the, the younger we start, we tend to see a little bit less of the food anxiety really entrenched. Uh, in the really young ones, it's, it's more entrenched to like in the mom and the dad than it is actually in the patient. Um, 
So catching them uh, younger and at an earlier age can really help with this component of it as well. But this is a, a very important goal that we need to achieve for our patients. Now, this is always a question I have. Um, this should actually see, should say post-dosing, not post-dating, but um, no post-dosing activity limitation. That really, really is a lofty goal. Now, I have achieved it uh, in several of my patients out here in Southern California, there, there's a group of people that are, you know, young men and young women who are trying to get into uh, the military, whether it be one of the military academies or, or just into, uh, you know, right into the Army, the Navy, the Air Force, the Marines, the Coast Guard. We've, we've done it all here. Um, and I've had several of my patients be able to achieve a top dose, um, do maintenance for a period of time, uh, do triple dose, and then what I usually do is do exercise challenges in these people, um, and I will even go as far as to um, make them do some exercising uh, outdoors. Um, you know, I just have them basically go out behind our, our office. We have an area where it gets hot on the blacktop, and I, and I have them uh, really work out intensely, um, and if they can do this vigorous uh, physical activity immediately post dose, and they can do that repeatedly, then I have a template that I'll write um, that includes in my template, it will include the accession standards to get into whatever branch of the military they're trying to get into. And, it, you know, talking about the food challenges we've done and so forth. And I've had pretty good success with those people. Um, and like I said, I've got patients in Naval Academy, um, West Point, uh, and even into the Air Force Academy, as well as several just into uh, the different branches. And we're working with a kid right now for Coast Guard. Um, so really, most patients can't do this just immediately. It takes time, energy, and effort. Not everybody's gonna be able to do it. It really depends on the severity of their reactions. People that have had a grade three anaphylactic reaction or more, um, I, I have found it's probably less likely in those patients. Um, however, you know, you, you just follow that desensitization curve and you kind of see, well, you know, some people plateau and they're just not going to go any farther. Those patients, I'm like, this is not for you. Um, so it is a lofty goal, but you can achieve it with a certain subset of patients. Now, what about decreasing dose frequency? Many patients can achieve this during the first year. It really depends on what their long-term goals are. Like I said, uh, earlier, um, I look at this desensitization curve business. I've been talking about the higher the dose, I think it's easier than to miss doses. So if you have somebody who's on eight grams every day um, and they want to switch to every other day, uh, in my brain, that's kind of like doing four grams daily. I don't really think that you lose that much uh, by doing that. So. I don't ask my patients to go down to four grams daily. I, I keep them at eight grams, uh, but usually within the first year, I'll let them miss at least one or two days a week. Recall, as we're doing our updosing, um, if something happens and, and, and a patient misses a dose, we tell them they can go two days without a dose, but on the third day, they need to come back into the office. So we don't wanna make this a routine where they're missing two days every week. I'm just saying, even during buildup, there are times when patients don't have to be perfect. Things come up, and we don't always have to downdose. So once they've achieved their maintenance, and they that for a peanut in my practice, we do weekly dosing. Um, so that takes about three and a half, four months, depending on on the you know the patient. Could take longer, um, but I like them to stay on maintenance for at least that six months and do the triple dose. And then if they did well on that, we, we let them drop uh, at least one day. And then over that three to five year time period, following every year, I repeat skin test, blood test, sometimes more frequent. Um, then I have several patients that are on every other day and I have um, you know, many patients that are on twice a week as well. I believe the higher the dose, the more likely you are to need less frequent dosing. So if you are a low doser, like if you're at two grams, or if you're using a commercially available product, um, then that's a low dose, and that's you just need to stick with daily dosing in them. I don't think you're going to be able to change the dosing interval uh, that much with the lower doses. All right, this is always a question that people ask me. When do I 
um, you know, not need to carry epi anymore, Dr. Carr. Well, first off, uh, I live in California, a very litigious state. So I always tell people it's better to have it and not need it than need it and not have it. So I always give them epi and I always give them a two pack. And you all know that uh, about, depending on what study you look at, 20 to 30% of patients that need epi need a second dose. So that's why we give them two packs. And there's sometimes there's also device failure. It, it has occurred. Uh, there's multiple reports of it. Um, so I always make sure that they have a two pack. Um, if patients do this on their own, um, it's basically um, a decision they've made once they achieve this quote unquote free eat and they've achieved some of their other milestones that they're, they're shooting for. And it usually is going to be kind of in that three to five year uh, time interval of doing a continuous daily OIT, realizing nobody's 100%. Uh, I have had, just, a, just fair warning, um, I have had some patients that have returned even after a few years, even after, you know, three years of doing OIT, um, and they never had any problems. And then out of the blue, they had an anaphylactic reaction. So uh, usually there's some kind of cofactor infection, heat, exercise. Um, you know, they kind of slacked off on their dosing um, and they lost their desensitized state. Um, so I have seen these case reports. So in my practice, I always tell them it's better to be safe than sorry. You should just have the epi. I don't think we have the data yet to say that there is no risk. So as long as there is a risk, I'm going to give it to them. All right. That is the end of my presentation with regards to the goals, and Dr. Wasserman is talking about risk today. I have on this uh, slide here my name, my work email, and my website. Um, please reach out to me uh, if you guys have any questions, and then there's going to be a live session uh, following here very shortly. Thank you so much, Dr. Carr and Dr. Wasserman for both of those uh, thought-provoking presentations. A couple of follow-up questions that have already come in. The first question is gonna go to Dr. Wasserman. Uh, Dr. Wasserman, you spoke about the shared decision-making approach that you use in your practice. Um, how do you approach the topic of FDA-approved versus non-approved treatments? And do you have families that maybe have that bias towards having an FDA-cleared product? Uh, <clears throat> we don't uh, we don't offer treatment uh, with the commercial product. Uh, we've been uh, treating food allergy for 15 years and have used real food to treat food allergy, and so we don't offer the commercial product uh, from our food allergy center. If people want to use the uh, commercial product. Uh, they can go to another uh, another food allergist. Okay, thank you for that response. Um, and then uh, next question is to you, Dr. Carr. What percentage of your patient population prefers bite protection versus free eating? Because we've had reports of, of varying, um, you know, numbers of patients that what their ultimate goal and desire is in OIT. Yeah, great. Um, can you hear me? Can you guys yes, hear me there? Can. Yeah, okay. Um, great question. You know, I think it's important, first off, to understand 100% of my patients just want to be safe. They want protection so they don't have a, uh, a severe life-threatening allergic reaction in the event that they have an accidental exposure. So 100% of them want that. The real question here is how, what percentage of patients want to free eat? And uh, that's a great question. I would say it's less. Dr. Carr, can you hear us? We can't hear you. You are mid-sentence and we lost you. Perhaps I can pick up on that before he comes back or until he comes back. Uh, yes, why don't you do that, Dr. Wasserman? Thank you. Sure. So it really depends on the food. 
uh, in our experience, somewhere around 30 to 40% of uh, peanut treated patients run right out and get a peanut product and love it. But the majority uh, eat peanuts because they have to. So uh, they would be content with the bite proof. I, I agree with Dr. Carr's point that the higher the dose, the more effective the desensitization. Um, if you shift over to other foods like milk, egg, wheat, uh, and more staple things where they're gonna be included in the diet routinely, the overwhelming majority, probably 90 to 95%, of people treated for egg, wheat, or milk, uh, and similar foods want to be able to routinely incorporate it in their diet and want to be able to free eat. All right, thank you so much. So yeah, I think that's really um, consistent with what we hear is that the vast majority of patients just want that emergency bite protection, that accidental exposure bite protection, rather than the desire to routinely ingest the food that they have been, you know, sort of conditioned to avoid for most of their life. But um, so, are those that, that are a little more adventurous or perhaps just really want to try that? All right, the well, next question- Before you go on, I um, think there's Dr. an important Carr issue uh, uh, about that um, with yes, the bite ahead. proof. Uh, and, and that is bite proofing with continued avoidance, which is the commercial product standard, is different from bite proofing and not having to worry about avoidance. Uh, so we have patients who will continue to avoid the food, but the freedom of not having to ask or check labels is important to them. So they'll go to a higher dose even though they're only interested in protection against an accident. Great, thank you for that clarification. Um, next question goes back to Dr. Carr, who I think is back on the line with us. Um, Dr. Carr, how have you successfully been getting approval for military service for your patients, those who have significant food allergy? Are they all managed with OIT? Is that how you're getting them to move forward in that process? Yeah, that's correct. Um, Basically, it's best for these people if they uh, start earlier rather than later. So what I do is I, I do OIT, and as I'm documenting my OIT with each updosing visit, I say in my note that the patient had a single dose food challenge. Um, and I have found when I write my ultimate letter um, and I say that they've had multiple food challenges, that's, that's very helpful. The other thing that I do is um, I make all of them do exercise challenge, uh, sometimes multiple challenges. And I, and I say in my letter that, you know, they've done uh, multiple exercise challenges, post-dosing, and that they've had no uh, problems. And then what I do is I, I pull up the Department of Defense accession standards for whatever branch of the military they are in. And I, and I quote them, you know, and then I say below that, that the patient has had multiple food challenges. They've been able to exercise freely. And then I put in language in there, like based on this information, there is no reason why this patient should not be able to be worldwide deployable. And I would request that they grant a waiver. And then that gets sent back to Dodmerb because um, they failed out at MEPS. And then a reviewer at Dodmerb then um, either approves or denies it. Great, thank you so much for that clarification. I know you know this is a question that does come up quite honestly, pretty um, frequently from families that have concerns over the limitations that may be placed on their child or young adult's career options. So thank you for sharing that. So final question goes to Dr. Wasserman. Do you have any concern about some allergists who are performing OIT without appropriate safe protocols for this procedure? I think OIT is complex and there are lots of nuances to the treatment. And there are many of areas of medicine where if there's a standardized, formalized protocol, the outcomes are better. And I think that that would apply to food allergy treatment as well. Uh, I haven't heard of any such practitioners. I guess there are some out there, but 
I think it's very important to have a standardized, formal approach uh, to OIT. Thank you, Dr. Wasserman. We agree. And, and again, um, there are FDA approved and FDA non-approved um, options. We find that families do want to know about all options and make informed decisions. And so we certainly support that shared decision-making process that weighs both the risk and benefits of all available options. Um, the final question that just came in, I'll, I'll put, pose it to you, Dr. Carr. Any information about OIT with those living with mast cell disorder? Wow, that's a great, great question. Um, I can tell you in some of the clinical trials that uh, I'm currently doing, um, I'm doing one that involves an IV infusion of uh, peanut protein coated with nanoparticles. That study is requiring us to screen for mast cell disorders. So I, I'm not aware of the mast cell disorder data like we have with, you know, stinging insect uh, patients. Um, but it's something as allergists, we're always on the lookout for. And if somebody is having so many reactions that it just doesn't make sense, I do screen them with a serum tryptase. Yes. Yeah, you know, I, I actually um, had a conversation with a 24-year-old living with mast cell, um, and it, it opened my eyes to really the just a, a whole nother understanding and level of what those patients are going through. And so I think yet another area for additional research and solutions and appreciate that question. Well, thank you, Dr. Carr. Thank you, Dr. Wasserman. Really appreciate, appreciate your insights today. And we're gonna turn to our final formal presentation of the day, which is by Dr. Tina Sinder. And Dr. Sinder um, is going to speak on uh, what is your brand of genes and the genetic component, epigenetic component here? Dr. Sender joined the Sean M. Parker Center for Allergy and Asthma Research at Stanford University in January of 2017. She's a clinical associate professor there in the Department of Medicine, Division of Pulmonary and Critical Care Medicine. She divides her time between research at the Sean Parker Center and outpatient clinical care of pediatric allergy and immunology patients. She completed her residency at Albert Einstein College of Medicine, Children's Hospital at Montefiore in Bronx, New York, and her fellowship in allergy and immunology at CHOP, Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. We have a lot of uh, Philadelphia uh, associations today. She's the principal investigation investigator of several clinical trials addressing atopic conditions and is the director of clinician training at Sean Parker Center. Uh, she's the director of oral immunotherapy clinic at the Lucille Packard Children's Hospital within that uh, outpatient pediatric clinic, and her present interests lie primarily in food allergy and eosinophilic esophagitis research uh, around strategies for prevention, diagnosis, and novel therapeutics. So let's welcome Dr. Sender and get her... everyone. Thank you for having me here to speak to you. Um, my name is Dr. Tina Sinder. I'm an allergist and immunologist at Stanford University at the Sean and Parker Center for Allergy and Asthma Research. And today I'm going to talk to you about genetics and food allergy. What is your brand of genes? Um, this slide just goes over my disclosures. I have received grant support from um, the NIH, from the Consortium of Food Allergy Research, um, Regeneron, DPV, AMUN, Novartis, and Sanofi, all in the conduct of food allergy related uh, clinical research trials. And I have served as an advisory committee member for AstraZeneca and DPV um, in the space of allergies. 
As most of you are already aware, the prevalence of food allergy has been rising, not just in the United States, but across all continents. Food allergy is a global issue. The rising burden has prompted more research into not just better therapeutic options and better ways for diagnosis, but also the why. If we better understand the reasons behind the increasing number of food allergy, perhaps we can take steps to prevent it. There are numerous factors that have been implicated in the development of food allergy. Most of these are environmental exposures early in childhood. Um, there is diet, uh, exposure to vitamin D, uh, animals, uh, your microbiome, and what the diet is in early childhood. However, there has been um, tendencies where we've seen a, an hereditary pattern pop up. So as early as 1995, the trend of increased rates in family was noted. The investigators found that allergy was more common in successive generations. So peanut allergy was reported by 0.1% of grandparents, 0.6% of aunts and uncles, 1.6% of parents, and then 6.9% of siblings. The authors found that peanut allergy is more common in siblings of people with peanut allergy and, and deduced that this there must be a hereditary pattern to this. In another study, the investigators looked at 75 pairs of twins where at least one twin had peanut allergy. The investigators found that identical twins were nearly 10 times more likely for both twins to have peanut allergy compared to non-identical twins. It's not just genetics alone, but rather the interaction between the existing background genetics and environmental exposures. In 2021, Clark et al. conducted a nationwide survey in Canada to examine the independent effect of demographic characteristics on food allergy. And from their survey results, they found that Canadian-born children of Southeast and East Asian immigrant parents had the higher reported food allergy than children born to Canadian-born parents. This suggests that there is an interplay between the genetic background and the environmental exposures. And this could be things like climate, diet, microbial ex exposure. Um, and based on the genetic background there is, these sort of different effects result in a differential outcome in food allergy development. A genetic mutation in the skin has also been very well studied, um, and this is these are known as filaggrin mutations. In a population-based study by Bra et al. Um, published uh, last year, uh, children carrying at least one filaggrin loss of mutation, I'm sorry, at least one filaggrin loss of function mutation were at increased risk for developing peanut allergy if they had high environmental peanut exposure in their bed dust around the time of their birth. And by bed dust, I mean kind of in their bedding, in their environment, in their playroom. And what the authors found was that for each unit increase in peanut dust, there was a six-fold increase in school-age peanut sensitization um, over time. And with filaggrin loss of mut function mutation, um, it is associated with atopic dermatitis or eczema. And filaggrin protein deficiency leads to skin barrier abnormality, which allows for the entry of irritants, different pathogens and allergens. And this is what elicits uh, what we call a Th2 inflammatory response or an allergic, atopic allergic response. And this is the allergic response that leads to the development of food allergy. So we suspect that this connection between filaggrin and food allergy may be connected with how our skin barrier is developing and um, how that affects the immune dysfunction.
Although there has been a lot of evidence that there is a hereditary component of food allergy, our understanding of genetic causes for food allergy is still in its infancy. Several genes have been found to be associated with a higher risk of developing food allergy, such as STAT6, CD14, um, filaggrin, like I just mentioned, IL-13, and other epigenetic modifications, um, such as FOXP3, but we still need to be careful when interpreting this information, such as these genes are not associated, they're only found to be associated, not causative. So this is just a signal for now, and we, it's not a definitive confirmed genetic link or or um, guaranteed to lead to food allergy. And then food allergy development is very complex and due to, as I mentioned before, a combination of many different things. So not just genetic and epigenetic, but also environmental factors such as microbiome, diet, early exposure um, to siblings and pets can all be protective. So it's very important to continue our exploration of the process behind food allergy development and keep an eye out for the genetic risk factors that we identify. And the other thing I wanted to mention is, you know, even if someone were found to have a genetic predisposition, um, researchers at the moment are, high, are exploring in great detail strategies for prevention of food, of food allergy. There are three known strategies of food allergy prevention that are currently being explored. Um, studies have shown that exposure to food allergens through the impaired skin barrier may promote the development of food allergy. So there has been increased efforts to see if whether early exposure to skin creams and treating eczema aggressively can actually reduce that risk. Um, some birth cohort studies have also shown that enriched infant formulas that contain pre and probiotics may have a role in prevention of food allergies, very similar to what breast milk has shown to do. And then numerous other studies have shown that earlier exposure to foods, um, di dietary diversity may be protective and can reduce the risk of developing food allergy later in life. And this concept of early exposure to food orally while reducing the exposure through your skin and aggressive management of um, the skin barrier is called the dual allergen exposure hypothesis. So in the last five years, several um, large committees such as the American Academy of Pediatrics um, and in Europe have all been exploring um, changing up and highlighting their early exposure guidelines. For instance, the AAP has, is now recommending early exposure to peanut. Um, and then for the EAT study performed in Europe, they are in Europe, there is um, increased recommendation to introduce milk and egg early as well. And in addition to these strategies, there are the six Ds of food allergy prevention that I talk to with all my um, families and patients and research participants. And these include diet, dirt, dogs, dry skin, detergents, and vitamin D. And so the way this all plays out is diet is dietary diversity, so early exposure. Dirt is kind of plays on the hygiene hypothesis and just being outside in nature and playing in dirt. Dogs, apparently dogs bring in a lot of allergens from the outside, so early exposure to dogs has been found to be protective. Dry skin prevention, so this is where moisturizers and early steroid treatment for eczema is, can play a role. Detergents can actually worsen skin barrier dysfunction, so minimizing um, detergent use or just being mindful of what detergents are being used can actually help uh, the skin heal. And then vitamin D, either through sunlight or supplementation has been found to be protective. And, um, and to end on a note of a patient who has undergone um, one of our food allergy research trials and what their experience has been. And this of course is about one of our patients. Um, his name is Fisher. He and another brother, he's one of three siblings and two of the brothers 
have food allergy. And his brother was able to um, receive food allergy therapy through his primary allergist. But then Fisher came to our research center to be treated at our center. And I just wanted to share his story saying genetics and heredity aside, we are at a stage in food allergy management where we can actually do something about it. Um, so at six months of age, Fisher was rushed to the hospital with an anaphylactic shock after eating um, a wheat teething biscuit. Another time he went into shock just from walking into a pizza shop where flour was in the air. And now he's 10 and a recent graduate of one of our clinical trials known as Combine. And per his family, he can now eat small portions of multiple foods that he was previously allergic to. No more canceled play dates because other parents were too nervous previously to host him at their house. No more missed opportunities to vacation in remote locations because they were too far from the hospital and no more constant anxiety around food. And now Fisher is looking forward to eating an English muffin and going fishing for crabs and shrimp foods he previously couldn't even touch. So this trial made a great impact on Fisher and his entire family because it really is not just the person with food allergies, but also their entire family where the quality of life is affected. Um, so I just wanted to share that story as a final note. Um, and thank you so much for your attention and time. And it was such a treat to get a chance to talk to you all. And this is my email address if you uh, need to email me or reach out for any questions. Thank you so much. Great. Thank you so much, Dr. Sender. We do have a couple of questions, and I know that you're on the line. So first, the question, just to clarify, the acronym of FLN, would you explain what that is used for? Yes, and um, I'm so glad someone found it. That is a typo. It should be FLG. So thank you for catching that. <laughs> Okay, great. So FLG, and that is for filagrin, right? That is correct. Thank you. Yes. And is there a filagrin genetic test currently commercially available on the market? That is a great question. Commercially, no, but we are still trying to understand that link. For instance, not everyone with eczema or filagrin mutation ends up with food allergies. So it's, it's a little more complex, but in all our prevention studies and food allergy studies, we are trying to incorporate more testing just to see what kind of associations we can find and whether it, it makes sense to have that testing available down the line. Great. And then one final question for you. Um, there at the Sean Parker Center, are you all using the newer diagnostic test results like component diagnostic or um, the epitope testing to decide how to approach OIT, i.e. when to have the beginning dose, when to um, escalate treatment or move to a maintenance dose? That is an excellent question. And we are constantly on the lookout for new diagnostics. We're doing basophil activation tests. We're working with the UK for mast cell activation tests. We are doing, um, we are working with allergenists who are doing kind of the very broad epitope testing and what we are actually doing to see how the data lines up. Um, and allergenists actually used some of our prior research outcomes as validation studies. So we, we have a, um, a collaborative spirit already with that team. And uh, what we're doing currently, we kind of blind ourselves. We um, draw blood through epitope testing, then we conduct the food challenge. And then when the lab results come back, we try to align with whether what we saw in practice is what the blood uh, test studies show. So we, we are trying to do more validation studies on that to see whether it will, um, uh, how we should incorporate it in our uh, clinical practice. But yes, we are, work we are working with other teams around the world trying to understand better diagnostics. Great. And a final question just came in that's a really fascinating one. And I know that you all have um, likely, if anyone has the data, you do. So is there any data on the children of moms who have gluten-free diets and what their um, rate of wheat allergy or, or other food allergies may be? Hmm. What we have seen is, th that's an interesting question. I don't know the answer to that. And I don't know if it's been looked at that in that much detail. Um, currently, we found that a diverse diet in mom is, uh, is protective, but the, it's 
kind of small numbers. It's um, all in, you know, statistics and there's improvement or, yes. you know, worsening. It doesn't give us exact data on, you know, um, yes, you know, having this diet decreases the risk in, you know, X percent of the population. Um, we are recommending diverse dietary diversity, but at the same time, if mom is unable to have it because of intolerances or allergies or autoimmune conditions like celiac disease, um, we wouldn't impose that on mom. But as one of the prior um, lecturers mentioned, early diversity, dietary diversity in the child is of utmost importance. Um, so if that is something maybe they had reduced exposure to, um, as soon as they're able to eat solids, kind of being mindful of trying to introduce these foods early so that if there's even a chance, perhaps the early introduction can offset that increased risk. Yes, thank you so much for reinforcing that. And, and yes, I think that it's one of those unanswered questions, right? That we still need additional data specifically um, around that topic. But I do think that we have touched on it in the, the, the topics, preceding topics around maternal diet and the data there as well as um, the early introduction. So as we come to the close of the very first day of our Global Food Allergy Summit 2022, um, I just wanna thank all of the speakers and, and the wonderful topics we have covered a breadth and depth of topics over the last four hours, um, and, and certainly um, some, some things that I had not heard, some insights that certainly I can take on to support my own family in the journey, but certainly also the millions of families that Allergy and Asthma Network and the Global Allergy and Airways Patient Platform support, um, as well as global food therapy. So, you know, as we look back on the day, we started with a conversation about knowing your why and keeping that why at the forefront. I would challenge you to come back tomorrow and to engage with us as we continue down that journey. Um, we looked at the real pandemic of food allergy, talked about proper diagnosis and testing, food allergy guidelines and research, uh, covered off on severity of reaction, as well as the impact of maternal diet and early introduction of foods, and then moved into the medical management and the topics of moving beyond avoidance alone in oral immunotherapy, both approved and unapproved um, approaches to that, the risk and, and uh, goals of therapy. And I think that, again, across the, the entire spectrum of the day, whether we were talking about epigenetics and environment or maternal diet or severity of reaction or proper diagnosis, all of this I keep going back to, we are so much further along than we were just a few years ago. And one of the silver linings of the pandemic, in my opinion, is that we are thinking about new approaches, new approaches to telehealth and the way that we can support families in early introduction, new approaches to treatment that, again, employ a shared decision-making process of presenting all options and allowing families to tailor that to their personal needs. And so I am so incredibly hopeful and excited about what tomorrow will hold in the Global Food Allergy Summit, but also what the future holds for the millions across the globe living with food allergies today. So as we close our time together, I wanna to once again thank Dr. Shaw and Dr. Jones for the collaboration, thank the Allergy and Asthma Network team, as well as our AV team, technical team. Um, to do a hybrid event with 800 people across the world is not easy, and yet uh, I think that we have done it successfully today and look forward to seeing you all at 10 a.m. Eastern Time U.S. tomorrow. So on behalf of the network and Global Allergy Airways Patient Platform and Global Food Therapy, thank you and have a wonderful day.